A Change of Treatment by W. W. Jacobs for the 1903 Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. A Change of Treatment by W. W. Jacobs from Many Cargoes. Yes, I've sailed under some cute skippers in my time, said the night watchman. Them that go down in big ships see the wonders of the deep, you know, he added with a sudden chuckle. But the one I'm going to tell you about ought never to have been trusted out without his ma. A good many of my skippers had fads, but this one was the worst I ever sailed under. It's some years ago now. I had shipped on his bark, the John Elliot, as slow-going an old tub as ever I was aboard of, when I wasn't in quite a fit and proper state to know what I was doing, and I hadn't been in her two days afore I found out his obby through overhearing a few remarks made by the second mate, who came up from the dinner in a hurry to make em. I don't mind saws and knives hung round the cabin, he says to the fust mate, but when a chap has a human and alongside his plate studying it while folks is at their food, it's more than a Christian man can stand. That's nothing, says the fust mate, who had sailed with the bark afore. He's half crazy on doctoring. We nearly had a mutiny aboard once, owing to his wanting to hold a post-mortem on a man what fell from the masthead wanted to see what the poor feller died of i call it unwholesome says the second mate very savage he offered me a pill at breakfast the size of a small marble quite put me off my feet it did of course the skipper's fad soon got known for but i didn't think much about it till one day i seed old daniel dennis sitting on a locker reading every now and then he'd shut the book and look up closing his eyes and moving his lips like a hen drinking and then look down at the book again why dan i says what's up you ain't learning lessons at your time of life yes i am says dan very soft you might hear me say it it's this one about heart disease. He hands over the book, which was stuck full of all kinds of diseases, and winks at me hard. Picked it up on a book stall, he says. Then he shut his eyes and said his piece wonderful. It made me quite queer to listen to him. That's how I feel, says he, when he finished. Just strength enough to get to bed. Lend a hand, Bill, and go and fetch the doctor. Then I see his little game. But I wasn't going to run any risks, so I just mentioned, permiscuous like, to the cook, as old Dan seemed rather queer, and went back and tried to borrow the book, being always fond of reading. Old Dan pretended he was too ill to hear what I was saying, and afore I could take it away from him, the skipper comes hurrying down with a bag in his hand. "'What's the matter, my man?' says he. "'What's the matter?' I'm all right, sir, says old Dan, except that I've been swooning away a little. Tell me exactly how you feel, says the skipper, feeling his pulse. Then old Dan set his piece over to him, and the skipper shook his head and looked very solemn. How long have you been like this, he says. Four or five years, sir, says Dan. It ain't nothing serious, sir, is it? You lie quite still says the skipper, putting a little trumpet thing to his chest, and then listening. Um, there's serious mischief here, I'm afraid. The prognotice is very bad. Prog what, sir? says Dan, staring. Prognotice, says the skipper. At least I think that's the word he said. You keep perfectly still, and I'll go and mix you up a draft, and tell the cook to get some strong beef tea on. Well, the skipper had no sooner gone than Cornish Harry, a great big lumbering chap of six feet, too, 
goes up to old Dan, and he says, Gimme that book. Go away, says Dan. Don't come worrying here. You are the skipper. Say how bad my prognotice was. You lend me the book, says Harry, catching hold of him, or else I'll bang you first and split to the skipper arterward. I believe I'm a bit consumptive. Anyway, I'm going to see. He dragged the book away from the old man and began to study. There was so many complaints in it he was almost tempted to have something else instead of consumption, but he decided on that at last, and he got a cough what worried the fossil all night long. And the next day, when the skipper came down to see Dan, he could hardly hear himself speak. That's a nasty cough you got, my man, says he, looking at Harry. Oh, it's nothing, sir, says Harry, careless like. I've had it for months now, off and on. I think it's perspiring so of a night, does it? What, says the skipper, do you perspire of a night? Dreadful, says Harry. You could wring the clothes out. I suppose it's healthy for me, ain't it, sir? Under your shirt, says the skipper, going over to him and sticking the trumpet again him. Now, take a deep breath. Don't cough. I can't help it, sir, says Harry. It will come. Seems to tear me to pieces. You get to bed at once, says the skipper, taking away the trumpet and shaking his head. It's a fortunate thing for you, my lad. You're in skilled hands. With care, I believe I can pull you round. How does that medicine suit you, Dan? Beautiful, sir, says Dan. It's wonderful soothing. I slept like a newborn babe, Arter it. I'll send you to get some more, says the skipper. You're not to get up, mind, either of you. All right, sir, says the two in very faint voices, and the skipper went away, Arter telling us to be careful not to make a noise. We all thought it a fine joke at first, but the airs them two chaps give themselves was something sickening. Being in bed all day, they was naturally wakeful of a night, and they used to call across the forecastle, inquiring arter each other's healths and waking us other chaps up. And they'd swap beef tea and jellies with each other, and Dan would try and coax a little port wine out of Harry, which he had to make blood with. But Harry would say he hadn't made enough that day, and he'd drink to the better health of old Dan's prognotice and smack his lips until it drove us a most crazy to ear him. After these chaps had been ill two days, the other fellers began to put their heads together, being maddened by the smell of beef tea and the like, and said they was going to be ill too, and both the invalids got into a fearful state of excitement. "'You'll only spoil it for all of us,' says Harry, "'and you don't know what to have without the book.' It's all very well doing your work as well as your own, says one of the men. It's our turn now. It's time you two got well. Well, says Harry. Well? Why, you silly, ignorant chaps. We shan't never get well. People with our complaints never do. You ought to know that. Well, I shall split, says one of them. You do, says Harry. You do, and I'll put a ed on you that all the port wine and jellies in the world wouldn't cure. Besides, don't you think the skipper knows what's the matter with us? Afore the other chaps could reply, the skipper himself comes down, accompanied by the fust mate with a look on his face which made Harry give the deepest and hollowest cough he'd ever done. What they really want, says the skipper, turning to the mate, is careful nussin i wish you'd let me nuss em says the fuss mate only ten minutes i'd put em both on their legs and run em for their lives into the bargain in ten minutes hold your tongue sir says the skipper what you say is unfeeling besides being an insult to me do you think i studied medicine all these years without knowing when a man's ill the fuss mate growled something and went on deck and the skipper started examining of em again. 
He said they was wonderfully patient lying in bed so long, and he had em wrapped up in bedclothes and carried on deck, so as the pure air could have a go at em. We had to do the carrying, and there they sat, breathing the pure air, and looking at the fuss mate out of the corners of their eyes. If they wanted anything from below, one of us had to go and fetch it and by the time they was taken down to bed again we all resolved to be took ill too only two of em did it though for harry who was a powerful ugly-tempered chap swore he'd do all sorts of dreadful things to us if we didn't keep well and hearty and all except these two did one of em mike rafferty laid up with a swelling on his ribs which i knew myself he had had for fifteen years and the other chap had paralysis. I never saw a man so really happy as the skipper was. He was up and down with his medicines and his instruments all day long, and used to make notes of the cases in a big pocket book and read them to the second mate at meal times. The forecastle had been turned into hospital about a week, and I was on deck doing some odd job or the other when the cook comes up to me, pulling a face as long as a fiddle. "'Another invalid,' says he. "'Fuss mate's gone stark staring mad.' "'Mad?' says I. "'Yes,' says he. "'He's got a big basin in the galley, "'and he's laughing like a hyena, "'and mixing bilge water and ink "'and paraffin and butter and soap "'and all sorts of things up together. "'The smell's enough to kill a man. "'I've had to come away.' "'Curious-like, I just walked up to the galley, and puts my ed in, and there was the mate, as the cook said, smiling all over his face and ladling some thick, sticky stuff into a stone bottle. "'How's the poor sufferer, sir?' says he, stepping out of the galley, just as the skipper was going by. "'They're very bad, but I hope for the best,' says the skipper, looking at him hard. "'I'm glad to see you're turned a bit more feeling.' "'Yes, sir.' says the mate. I didn't think so at fust, but I can see now them chaps is all very ill. You'll excuse me for saying it, but I don't quite approve of your treatment. I thought the skipper would have bust. My treatment, says he. My treatment? What do you know about it? You're treating them wrong, sir, says the mate. I have here, patting the jar, a remedy which would cure them all if you'd only let me try it. Pooh, says the skipper. One medicine cure all diseases? The old story. What is it? Where'd you get it from? says he. I brought the ingredients aboard with me, says the mate. It's a wonderful medicine discovered by my grandmother, and if I might only try it, I'd thoroughly cure them poor chaps. Rubbish, says the skipper. Very well, sir, says the mate, shrugging his shoulders. Of course, if you won't let me, you won't. Still, I tell you, if you'd let me try, I'd cure em all in two days. That's a fair challenge. Well, they talked and talked and talked, until at last the skipper give way and went down below with the mate and told the chaps they was to take the new medicine for two days, just to prove the mate was wrong. Let poor old Dan try it first, says Harry, starting up and sniffing as the mate took the cork out. He's been awful bad since you've been away. Harry's worse than I am, sir, says Dan. It's only his kind heart that makes him say that. It don't matter which is fussed, says the mate, filling a tablespoon with it. There's plenty for all. Now, Harry. Take it, says the skipper. Harry took it, and the fuss he made you'd have thought. He was swallowing a football. It stuck all round his mouth, and he carried on so dreadful that the other invalids was half sick afore it came to them. By the time the other three had had theirs, it was as good as a pantomime, and the mate corked the bottle up and went and sat down on a locker while they tried to rinse their mouths out with the luxuries which had been given him. How do you feel? says the skipper. I'm dying, says Dan. So am I says Harry. I believe the mate's pisoned us. The skipper looks over at the mate, very stern, and shakes his head slowly. It's all right, 
says the mate. It's always like that, the first dozen or so doses. Dozen or so doses, says old Dan, in a faraway voice. It has to be taken every twenty minutes, says the mate, pulling out his pipe and lighting it. And the four men groaned all together. I can't allow it says the skipper i can't allow it men's lives mustn't be sacrificed for an experiment ten experiment says the mate very indignant it's an old family medicine well they shan't have any more says the skipper firmly look here says the mate if i kill any one of these men i'll give you twenty pound honor bright i will make it twenty-five says the skipper considering very good says the mate twenty-five i can't say no fairer than that can i it's about time for another dose now he gave him another tablespoonful all round as the skipper left and the chaps what wasn't invalids nearly bust with joy he wouldn't let him have anything to take the taste out cause he said it didn't give the medicine a chance and he told us other chaps to remove the temptation and you bet we did after the fifth dose, the invalids began to get desperate, and when they heard they'd got to be woke up every twenty minutes through the night to take the stuff, they sort of gave up. Old Dan said he felt a gentle glow stealing over him and strengthening him, and Harry said that it felt like a healing balm to his lungs. All of them agreed it was a wonderful sort of medicine, and Arter the sixth dose the man with paralysis dashed up on deck and ran up the rigging like a cat. He sat there for hours, spitting, and swore he'd brain anybody who interrupted him, and arter a little while, Mike Rafferty went up and joined him, and if the fuss mate's ears didn't burn by reason of the things them two poor sufferers said about him, they ought to. They was all doing full work next day, and though, of course, the skipper saw how he'd been done. He didn't allude to it. Not in words, that is. But when a man tries to make four chaps do the work of eight and hits em when they don't, it's a easy job to see where the shoe pinches. End of A Change of Treatment by W. W. Jacobs The Elm Tree by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman for the 1903 collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Elm Tree by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. The Elm Tree had his field to himself. He stood alone in a wide and deep expanse of wind-swept grass which once a year surged round him in foaming billows, crested with a rose of clover, and the whiteness of daisies, and the gold of buttercups. The rest of the time the field was green with an even slant of lush grass, or else it was a dun surface, or else a glittering level of snow, but always there stood the tree, with his green branches in the summer, his gold ones in the autumn, his tender gold-green ones in the spring, and his branches of naked grace in the winter. But always he was superb. There was not in the whole countryside another tree which could compare with him. He was matchless. Never a stranger passed the elm but stopped and stared and said something or thought something about it. Even dull rustics looked and had a momentary lapse from vacuity. The tree was compelling. He insisted upon a recognition of his beauty and grace. Let one try to pass him unheeding and sunken in the contemplation of his own little affairs, and, lo, he would force himself out of the landscape not only upon the eyes but the very soul which turned away from self would see the tree through its windows like a revelation and proof of that which is outside and beyond it became 
at such times to some minds something akin to testimony of god something there was about the superb acres of those great branches curving skyward and earthward with matchless symmetry of line which seemed to furnish an upward lift for thought and imagination the field in which the tree stood was a great parallelogram on the left-hand side across a stone wall was a house almost as old as the tree on the other side across a new painted fence was a modern house pretentious and ornate with bracketed cornices bay windows a piazza and a cupola this cupola especially disturbed the mind of the dweller in the old house the name of this dweller was david ransom he was quite old and had a stiff leg which necessitated a gait wherein one limb described a rigid half-circle before it was brought to the accomplishment of a forward step he had been incapacitated from work for some years all he had in the world was his poor ancient house and an acre of land in the rear on which he raised vegetables and kept a few hens which furnished his humble sustenance once it had been very different he had owned the great field on which the elm stood he had even owned the new house beyond although in a simpler form he had built it very largely with his own hands for though ostensibly a farmer he had been a jack of all trades and able to turn his hand to almost any craft with skill he had lived in the old ransom house which had been in the family for four generations, until he was almost an old man, and his wife an old woman. Then, with the pitiful savings of a lifetime, he had built the new one. He had loved and handled tenderly every nail he had put into it, every fragrant length of pine. He had built it with the utmost that was in him. Then, just as it was finished, he had lost it the bank in which his savings were stored had failed and there was nothing to meet the payments for the stock he sold the house and the field at a miserable sacrifice and used the proceeds to pay the bills all except a proportion which he was obliged to work out the old wife died shortly afterward the disappointment had been too much for her all her life she had planned and dreamed about the new house which was to stand on the vacant lot she had thought about it until in a sense she had really lived in it and an actual building had tumbled about her ears after she died david lived alone and wound himself up like a caterpillar in a cocoon of repining and misanthropy he seemed bitter to the core he was in spirit a revolutionist and anarchist. The mention of banks sent him into a white heat of rage. He nursed his grievances until they turned upon himself and stung him to his own spiritual harm. One of his special bitternesses was the improvements which the new owner had made in his new house. He resented them as he might have done any pointing out of his own personal defects. When the new owner, whose name was Thomas Savage, set about building the bay window on the blank of the south wall, David fairly swelled with indignation and humiliation. That morning he went across the road and unbottled his wrath to old Abner Slocum. Old Abner lived with his daughter, who was a dressmaker. It was an unskillful, desultory way of dressmaking, at very low prices and thereby supported in frugal comfort herself and her father who was very deaf old abner on pleasant days in warm weather spent most of his time on the porch for his room was better than his company in the sitting-room which was also the apartment used for fitting dresses david ransom spent many an hour with him seated on the top step of the porch abner had an old kitchen chair tipped back against the house wall on that morning 
When the scaffolding for the new bay window was erected, David went across the street, swinging his lame leg around viciously. That was the second spring after the rheumatism had attacked him. It was a hot, moist morning in early May. The trees were beginning to cast leaf shadows, and the air was cloyed with sweet. Old David, on the porch, was in his shirt sleeves. His feet were covered with great carpet slippers. He grinned vacuously as David approached. A curtain of a window behind him went down with a snap shutting out a glimpse of a young woman upon whom his daughter was about to try a new gown. Abner did not hear it, but he felt it, and he smiled slyly at the newcomer. Mary's trying on a new gown to the Ames gal, he chuckled. David nodded with impatient scorn. The curtain might as well have been lowered for a shadow as for him. He settled himself laboriously on the porch step in front of Abner. His lame leg was stretched out unbendingly into Maria Slocum's bed of ladies' delights, which came up faithfully in their old place every spring. David ground his heel viciously down among the flowers. He scowled at Abner with almost malignity. He jerked a shoulder toward the right. See what they are doing over there? he inquired, gruffly. Old Abner did not hear him. He had been gazing forth at the glories of the spring morning, and he answered from the fullness of his thought. Yes, I guess spring is most here, sure enough, he said happily. He made a curious nestling motion with his old shoulders in a warm sunbeam which lay over them like a caressing arm. He smiled contentedly. Now were come for him the long days of peaceful dozing on the porch, undisturbed by his daughter's dressmaking, the days of plenty of garden greens and vegetables and fruit. Keenly sensitive to material sweets was old Abner Slocum, but David Ransom sniffed with fury. Spring! he cried. Then he shouted, reaching out a knotted hand and clutching the other's lean shank with a fierce grip. He gesticulated violently toward the house on which the workmen were hammering. See what they're doing up over there, he demanded, biting off every word and syllable shortly, and old Abner heard, or, if he did not hear, grasped the meaning of the pointing hand and the smart grip on his leg. Yes, he answered cheerfully, making improvements, ain't they? Improvements? shrieked David Ransom. Improvements! Improvements! When that house was fit for the president to live in before! Improvements! Good Lord! That winder is gone to look real pooty, ain't it? inquired old Abner innocently. David glared. He rose, dragging his lame leg after him. Be you a fool! he shouted. Then he was gone down the path with his stiff strut, while old Abner gazed after him, amiably open-mouthed like a baby. Presently he began to nod, and finally fell asleep in the moist light, with his head sunken on his breast. But David Ransom sat alone on the doorstep of his old house, and all day long his regard never left the carpenters working on the new one across the field. When the bay window and the new piazza were completed, and the tin roofs glittered in the sun, David felt fairly ill. He neither ate nor slept. His eyes looked wild in their jungle of unkempt beard and long, white hair. He talked to himself a good deal. He made furious gestures when walking. Children turned to stare after him. Once in a while they ran away, when they saw him coming. There began to be talk of taking care of him, sending him somewhere to be looked out for, lest he do harm to himself and others. His old house and land might pay his board for the rest of his life, for he seemed feeble. David knew nothing of this. He continued to inveigh with a rancor, which had the force of malignity at the improvements, 
on the new house. When at last the cupola was built, that was the climax. When Maria Slocum saw him coming across the road to talk it over with her father, she hustled the old man into the house. "'David Ransom is clean out of his head,' she said, "'and I ain't going to have him coming over here. I'm afraid of him.' So when David reached the Slocum house, he found the door bolted and the window curtain down, with cautious gaps for peering at the sides, for Maria, her father, and a woman whom she was fitting. But David did not see them. He went stiffly home, talking all the way so loudly that they could hear what he said. Bad enough to have it in the fust place, then to go and build on it to winders, and piazzers, and cupolis, as if it wa'n't good enough for him. Guess what was good enough for Sarah and me was good enough for him. Then he finished with a refrain of misery. Windows, piazzas, capolis, new stun steps, and a new tin roof. He said the last in a sort of sing-song over and over. That was the burden of his thoughts, the summing up of his grievances. Something had ought to be done about David Ransom, said Maria Slocum to the woman who was being fitted, and the woman agreed with her. That night a strange thing happened, one of the catastrophes which served to punctuate and paragraph the monotony of village life. The new house which had been built by David Ransom and purchased and improved by Thomas Savage was burned to the ground. At midnight, the sky was rosy for miles around, and the air resonant with bells. At dawn, there was only a bed of glowing coals and ashes. Everybody, of course, suspected David, although there was no proof except his well-known bitterness regarding the improvements. He was under a ban, though he was not arrested. It was decided that he was a dangerous character in spite of his age and feebleness and ought not to be at such entire liberty to work out his own devices and that moreover he ought humanly speaking to be cared for comfortably one afternoon old abner slocum sitting on the front porch with a handkerchief over his face to keep the flies off and presumably dozing heard his daughter Maria tell the woman whom she was fitting that David was to be carried the next day to Eliezer Wise's to board. Eliezer and his wife had occasionally taken old people whom no one else wanted to board, for a small consideration. The town has took it up, said Maria. You don't say so, said the woman, turning sidewise to look at the fit of her bodice. Ain't there a little pouch with sleeve goes in? That'll be all right when it's stitched. They don't think it's safe for him to be round, and they don't think he has proper victuals. For my part, I ain't afraid of him as I used to be before the house was burnt. He don't talk to himself, nor make motions the way he used to. He just sits real kind of still on his doorstep. He come over here to see Father the other day, and he seemed real mild and gentle. I ain't a mite afraid of him, nor I ain't afraid he'll set me afire, and I never believed he set Thomas Savage afire. Miss Savage was always dreadful careless about fire, used to carry live coals and a shovel all over the house when she wanted to kindle fires in the airtight stoves, and the Savage boy made a bonfire in the barn once. They don't tell of it, on account of the insurance, but I heard it real straight, and they ain't going to build there again. Going out of town. Guess there's reason enough. I ain't going to believe that David Ransom did such a thing as that, if he did use to talk so. He's had an awful hard time, and it won't his fault. Suppose he'll take it hard going to Leezer's, said the woman. I'm dreadful afraid he will, and I don't blame him. I know Leezer Wise and his wife, too. I know how I'd feel if it was father going. Your father'll feel bad to have him go. 
Yes, I ain't dare to say anything about it to father. A little later, Maria, glancing out of the window, after taking in an underarm scene, exclaimed, Why, where's father? Ain't he there? asked the woman, screwing her head around. No, and he was sitting there just a minute ago, sound asleep. Well, maybe the flies plagued him, and he's gone down in the orchard under the trees. Sometimes he does. Old Abner Slocum had just toddled out of sight around the ransom house opposite to the garden where David was picking some corn for his supper. A little later he returned, and his daughter saw him. She came to the door, the woman's dress waist in her hand. "'Where have you been, father?' she cried, drawing her thread through. Old Abner did not hear, but he knew what she said. "'Over to David's,' he replied, quaveringly. His eyes looked watery, and his mouth unusually firm. Maria regarded him sharply. Then she reflected that he must have been asleep, and not able to hear, in any case, what she and the woman had been talking about. "'Well, you'd better sit down and keep cool, father,' said she. "'You look all head up.' Then she re-entered the house, and old Abner settled himself in his chair on the porch. Presently, one of the selectmen of the village, who lived a little farther down the road, and who was to take David to Eliezer Wise's next morning, rode by in a light express wagon in a cloud of dust. "'Hello, Abner. Hot day!' he shouted urbanely. Abner waited until he had passed, then he slowly shook his fist at him. The next morning, Maria Slocum kept the curtain of her front window facing the ransom house down. I don't know as you can see in here, she said to her first customer, but they are going to take David Ransom to board to Leaser Wise's this morning. They think he ought to be looked after, and I don't want to see it. He's lived there ever since I was born and father sits a heap by him, and he's had a hard time, poor man. I don't see why they can't let him alone. He never set that fire any more than I did, and he wouldn't hurt a baby kitten, never would, for all he used to talk so. If he ain't quite so comfortable where he is, he's enough sight happier than he'll be to Lazer's. I've heard Lazer Wise want any too mild, said the other woman. I wouldn't want father to go there, said Maria. There was a sound of wheels outside. Guess Leaser and John Daggett have come for him now, said Maria. The woman peeped round the curtain. Yes, they have, said she. It's John's wagon. They're going to try to let the house and have the rent pay his board, said Maria. See anything of him? No, they're just going in the front gate. Now they're knocking. Anybody come to the door? No, they're knocking again. Anybody come? No, now they're trying the door. Are they going in? Yes, they're going in. There was a silence. Presently, Maria spoke. See anything of him? No, can't see a sign of anybody. Ain't it dreadful queer? Seems to me it is. You don't suppose anything has happened, do you? I don't know. It's dreadful queer. The woman made an exclamation. <gasps> what is it? Asked Maria, anxiously. What do you see, Miss Abbott? Why, they're coming out, replied the woman. He with them? No, he ain't. My land. What is it? They're coming over here. Indeed, as she spoke, Eliza Wise and the selectman crossed the road to the Slocum house, and Maria ran trembling to the door. The woman who was being fitted stood back out of sight, since she had not her dress on, and listened at the door. She heard Maria reply to a question in her high, agitated voice. No, David Ransom ain't here. I ain't set eyes on him today. You can't find him? You don't say so. What do you suppose has happened to him? Old Abner Slocum sat on the porch, 
with his handkerchief over his eyes. He had not stirred. Maria shook him violently by the shoulder, as Eliezer Wise inquired of him if he had seen David Ransom that day, and his voice was strained to razor-like sharpness, though it was naturally soft. But old Abner did not hear. He gave a sleepy grunt like a disturbed animal, shrugged his shoulder loose from his daughter's grasp, flirted the handkerchief pettishly over his face, settled his head back, and gave vent to an ostentatious snore. Eliezer Wise, who was a thin-nosed, pensive-looking man, and the selectman, who was exceedingly tall and bore himself with a dull dignity, went their ways in the latter's light wagon, presumably to search for David Ransom. The horse was whipped to a smart trot. Maria called after them to know what they were going to do, but she got no response. She looked hard at her father, who sat quite still, making a loud purring sound. Then she went into the house. The minute she was gone, old Abner slipped the handkerchief from his face and stared with a wonderful keenness of bright old eyes across the road at the beautiful elm tree in the midst of the field in a rosy and green foam of grass and clover. He waved the handkerchief, which he had taken from his face. There was a tiny answering gleam of white from the massy greenness of the elm. Old Abner chuckled softly. Then he muttered to himself, Can't do nothing afore dark, and settled for a nap in good faith. It was a very warm night, and dark except for the stars. The twilight lingered long, but at last the village lay in deep shadow, and one could not distinguish objects far in advance. Once that night, Maria Slocum thought she heard a noise on the porch and got out of bed and thrust her head out of the open window. Anybody there? She called softly and timorously. There was a dead silence. She peered into the darkness, but could see nothing. She went back to bed and thought she must have been mistaken. Once after that she was wakened from sleep by a strange sound, and this time she lighted a candle and crossed the little entry to her father's room. She opened the door softly, and a glance showed her the gleam of the white head on the pillow. Must have been rats, she thought, and returned to her own chamber and slept undisturbed the rest of the night. The next morning she went into the pantry to cut some slices from a piece of corned beef and stared incredulously. She looked everywhere, standing on tiptoe to search the upper shelves. Then she hurried into the kitchen, where her father sat waiting for his breakfast. He cast a scared glance at her as she entered. Then he turned his chair around with a grating noise and stared intently out of the window. "'Well, you've got to go without your breakfast,' said Maria. Old Abner made no sign. Maria raised her voice higher. "'Can't you hear, father?' she cried. "'You'll have to go without your breakfast. There ain't a thing in the house to eat but some bread and butter.' The old man rolled one bright eye at her over his shoulder. Then he stared out of the window again. The red flush was evident, mounting his neck to his thin fringe of white hair. "'All that corned beef is gone, every mite of it proclaimed Maria, in a voice of tragedy. I heard a voice last night. I knew I did. There was a thief in this house last night, father. Old Abner appeared to hear. His shoulders heaved, but he did not look around. A thief came into this house through the pantry window and stole all that corned beef, repeated Maria. It's gone, and it couldn't go without hands. Some tramp, I suppose, that was hungry. I paid most fifty cents for that corned beef, but I suppose I ought to be thankful. He might have stole Miss Bemis's black silk dress. You'll have to put up with toasted bread for your breakfast, father. Do you hear, father? You'll have to put up with toasted bread and coffee for your breakfast. All right, mumbled the old man. Maria went out of the room, and the sound of the coffee mill in the shed resounded through the house.
Then old Abner turned around and noiselessly doubled himself up with merriment. The day was very pleasant and clear, although still warm. Maria toiled at her dressmaking, and old Abner sat peacefully on the porch. The selectman and Eliezer visited the house once and inquired if they had seen anything of David. They also searched again in the old Ransom house. In the afternoon, just after the two men had driven away, and Maria had the front curtains drawn to keep out the sun, old Abner stole around the house, got a tin pail from the pantry, drew it full of cold water at the well, and slunk swiftly, padding like an old dog in his carpet-slippered feet, across the opposite field to the elm tree. He stood underneath, casting wary glances around. He held the pail, catching a gleam of the western sun from its polished sides until it looked as if on fire. He fumbled away at its handle. Then suddenly, as if by some unseen agency, it was drawn up and out of sight into the green umbrage of the great tree. Old Abner turned about gleefully after a furtive hiss or whisper sent after the ascending pail, and his daughter Maria stood unexpectedly behind him. Slyness and sharpness were family traits. She had been suspicious ever since she had missed the meat in the morning. Old Abner turned quite pale. He chuckled feebly to hide his consternation, and he stared helplessly at Maria. What in creation are you doing here, father? she asked sternly. She spoke quite low, but he heard her perfectly. I ain't doing anything, Mary, he replied feebly, shifting in his carpet slippers. You needn't talk that way to me, father. I know better. You're up to something. What were you doing with that pail, and how came it to go up in the tree? Maria peered upward and stood transfixed. Out of the great spread of the tree, that majesty of green radiances and violet shadows and highlights as of emeralds, out of this very mottle as of jewels and shadows and sunbeams, stared the face of old David Ransom, and the face was inexpressibly changed. All the bitterness and rancor were gone. It was the face of a man in shelter from the woes and stress of life. He looked forth from the beautiful arms of the great tree, like a child from the arms of its mother. He had fled for shelter to a heart of nature, and it had not failed him. He smiled down at Maria with a peaceful triumph. They never thought of looking for me here, he called down. I won't go into Leaser's. David Ransom, you ain't been up there all this time in that tree, gasped Maria. Why, they've got men hunting in the woods, and they're going to drag the pond. David laughed in a silver strain as sweetly as a child. Never thought of looking for me here, said he. I want gone to Leaser's. How on earth did you ever get up there with your lame leg? I climb. How? You weren't up there all night. David nodded, setting the green leaves, nodding. He was comfortably astride a large bough, with another below it, affording him a rest for his feet. His back and head were against the trunk of the tree. He rested as comfortably as if in an armchair midway of the tree, entirely concealed from view except to one standing directly beneath him. "'It beats all,' said Maria. "'I suppose you carried him that corned beef, father. That was where it went to.' "'I won't go to let an old neighbor starve, Mary,' said old Abner, with boldness. Maria stood staring at him. "'I carried him some bread, too, and a piece of squash pie,' said old Abner, defiantly, in his cracked trouble of age. Maria looked up at old David in the tree. Mr. Ransom, you come down here as quick as you can, said she, authoritatively. David made an attempt to climb higher. His bow rocked. 
Come right down here, repeated Maria. You ain't got to go to Lazar's. I ain't afraid of you. You didn't set that house fire, did you? No, I didn't, called down David. Well, you come down here. You shan't go to Lazar's. You can board with me. I need the money as much as Lazar wise. You can have the south chamber, or you can sleep in your own house, if you want to, till it's rented, if you'd feel more to home. I've moved out of my own house, called David. All right, you can have the south chamber in my house, and you and father can have real good times together. Come down. Can't you get down? David began swinging himself downward with painful slowness. Be careful you don't fall and break your bones. David descended. When he was just ready to slide down the shaggy trunk below the spread of large branches, he paused and looked down at Maria with lingering doubt and distrust. You needn't be afraid, said Maria. The tears were running down her cheeks. You shan't go anywheres you don't want to. I'll look out for you, and I'd like to see anybody stop. There was decision in Maria's voice, which compelled confidence. Still, David looked down hesitatingly, like a child afraid to leave its mother. Come right along, said Maria, and look out you don't fall and break your bones. I've got some nice griddle cakes for supper and a custard pie. David slid down. After that, the two old men could have been seen all day seated on the porch of the Slocum house, wrapped in the silence of peaceful memories. A family moved into the old Ransom house, and they enjoyed watching the children play about. David took a fancy to one little girl. Sometimes he coaxed her over, and he told her one story of his own childhood which his father had told him. It was uncouth and pointless, but the child loved it, and the two men hailed its climax always with innocent laughter. The three were children together. Old David was never bitter nor rebellious in those days, but his mind was somewhat affected after a curious and, as some would have it, merciful fashion. Maria said openly that it was a blessing that he looked at things the way he did, that she believed that the Lord was sort of telling him stories to keep him going in his hard road of life, the way folks tell stories to children. She discovered it before old David had been domiciled with her twenty-four hours. It was the next morning after he came there. He and her father were talking together on the porch, and she heard David saying this to old Abner. "'You see that house over there?' said he. "'Ain't it handsome?' It's the handsomest house in this town, and it's all mine. Nobody else has the right to set foot in it. I had it painted green, and it's higher than the meeting house. Can't nobody find any fault with that house. Nobody is going to build cupolies nor bay windows on that. I can tell you, it's just right. Maria and the woman whom she was fitting stared at each other. Did you hear that? asked Maria, pale and trembling. He's out of his head, said the woman. Maria leaned out of the window. Where is your house, Mr. Ransom? She asked in a gentle voice. Old David pointed. He means the elm tree, said Maria. End of The Elm Tree by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman Morris and the Honorable Tim by Myra Kelly for the 1903 collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Morris and the Honorable Tim by Myra Kelly. On the first day of school, after the Christmas holidays, teacher found herself surrounded by a howling mob of little savages in which she had much difficulty in recognizing her cherished first reader class isadore belkatowski's face 
was so wreathed in smiles and foreign matter as to be beyond identification. Nathan Spiderwitz had placed all his trust in a solitary suspender and two unstable buttons. Eva Kedansky had entirely freed herself from restraining hooks and eyes. Isidore Applebaum had discarded shoelaces, and A.B. Ashnusky had bartered his only necktie for a yard of shoestring licorice. Miss Bailey was greatly disheartened by this reversion to the original type. She delivered daily lectures on nail brushes, hair ribbons, shoe polish, pins, buttons, elastic, and other means to grace. Her talks on soap and water became almost personal in tone, and her insistence on a close union between such garments as were meant to be united led to a lively traffic in twisted and disreputable safety pins. And yet the first reader class, in all other branches of learning so receptive and responsive, made but halting and uncertain progress toward that state of virtue which is next to godliness. Early in January came the report that Gumshoe Tim was on the warpath and might be expected at any time. Miss Bailey heard the tidings in calm ignorance until Miss Blake, who ruled over the adjoining kingdom, interpreted the warning. A license to teach in the public schools of New York is good for only one year. Its renewal depends upon the reports of the principal in charge of the school and of the associate superintendent, in whose district the school chances to be. After three such renewals, the license becomes permanent, but Miss Bailey was, as a teacher, barely four months old. The associate superintendent for her vicinity was the Honorable Timothy O'Shea, known and dreaded as Gumshoe Tim, owing to his engaging way of creeping softly up back stairs and appearing all unheralded and unwelcome upon the threshold of his intended victim. This, Miss Blake explained, was in defiance of all the rules of etiquette governing such visits of inspection. The proper procedure had been that of Mr. O'Shea's predecessor, who had always given timely notice of his coming and a hint as to the subjects in which he intended to examine the children. Some days later, he would amble from room to room, accompanied by the amiable principal, and followed by the gratitude of smiling and unruffled teachers. This kind old gentleman was now retired, and had been succeeded by Mr. O'Shea, who, in addition to his unexpectedness, was adorned by an abominable temper, an overbearing manner, and a sense of cruel humor. He had almost finished his examinations at the nearest school where, during a brisk campaign of eight days, he had caused five dismissals, nine cases of nervous exhaustion, and an epidemic of hysteria. Day by day, nerves grew more tense, tempers more unsure, sleep and appetite more fugitive. Experienced teachers went stolidly on with the ordinary routine, while beginners devoted time and energy to the more spectacular portions of the curriculum. But no one knew the Honorable Timothy's pet subjects, and so no one could specialize to any great extent. Miss Bailey was one of the beginners, and Room 18 was made to shine as the sun. Morris Mogolowski, monitor of the Goldfish Bowl, wrought busily until his charges glowed redly against the water plants in their shining bowl. Creepers crept, plants grew, and ferns waved under the care of Nathan Spiderwitz monitor of the window boxes. There was such a martial swing and strut in Patrick Brennan's leadership of the line that it inflamed even the timid heart of Isidore Wishnuski with a warlike glow and his feet with a spasmodic but well-meant tramp. Sadie Gonorowski and Ava, her cousin, sat close side by side, no longer mad on their cells, but the mid-kind feelings the work of the preceding term was laid in neat and docketed piles upon the low bookcase. The children were enjoined to keep clean and entire, and teacher, a nervous and unsmiling teacher, 
waited dully. A week passed thus, and then the good-hearted and experienced Miss Blake hurried ponderously across the hall to put Teacher on her guard. I've just had a note from one of the grammar teachers, she panted. Gumshoe Tim is up in Miss Green's room. He'll take this floor next. Now see here, child, don't look so frightened. The principal is with Tim. Of course, you're nervous, but try not to show it, and you'll be all right. His lay is discipline and reading. Well, good luck to you. Miss Bailey took heart of grace. The children read surprisingly well, were absolutely good, and the enemy, under convoy of the friendly principal, would be much less terrifying than the enemy at large and alone. It was, therefore, with a manner almost serene that she turned to greet the kindly concerned principal and the dreaded gumshoe Tim. The latter she found less ominous of aspect than she had been led to fear, and the principal's charming little speech of introduction made her flush with quick pleasure, and the anxious eyes of Sadie Garnaroski, noting the flush, grew calm as Sadie whispered to Eva, her close cousin. Say, teacher has a glad she's red on the face. It could be her papa. No, it's company, answered Eva sagely. It ain't her papa. It's company. The wild teacher takes him by the hand. The children were not in the least disconcerted by the presence of the large man. They always enjoyed visitors, and they liked the heavy gold chain which festooned the wide waistcoat of this guest. And, as they watched him, the associate superintendent began to superintend. He looked at the children, all, in their clean and smiling rows. He looked at the flowers and the goldfish, at the pictures and the plaster casts. He looked at the work of the last term, and he looked at teacher. As he looked, he swayed gently on his rubber heels and decided that he was going to enjoy the coming quarter of an hour. Teacher pleased him from the first. She was neither old nor ill-favored, and she was most evidently nervous. The combination appealed both to his love of power and his peculiar sense of humor. Settling deliberately in the chair of state, he began. Can the children sing, Miss Bailey? They could sing very prettily, and they did. Very nice indeed, said the voice of visiting authority. Very nice. Their music is exceptionally good. And are they drilled? Children, will you march for me? Again, they could, and did. Patrick marshaled his line in time and triumph up and down the aisles to the evident interest and approval of the company. And then, teacher, led the class through some very energetic Swedish movements. While arms and bodies were bending and straightening at teacher's command and example, the door opened, and a breathless boy rushed in. He bore an unfolded note, and, as teacher had no hand to spare, the boy placed the paper on the desk under the softening eyes of the Honorable Timothy, who glanced down idly, and then pounced upon the note and read its every word. "'For you, Miss Bailey,' he said in the voice before which even the school janitor had been known to quail. "'Your friend was thoughtful, though a little late.' and poor, palpitating Miss Bailey read. Watch out! Gumshoe Tim is in the building. The principal caught him on the back stairs, and they're going round together. He's as cross as a bear, green and dead faint in the dressing room. Says he's going to fire her. Watch out for him, and send the news on. His lay is reading and discipline. Miss Bailey grew cold with sick and unreasoning fear, as she gazed wide-eyed at the living confirmation of the statement that, Gumshoe Tim was as cross as a bear. The gentle-hearted principal took the paper from her nerveless grasp. It's all right, he assured her. Mr. O'Shea understands that you had no part in this. It's all right. You are not responsible. But teacher had no ears for his soothing. She could only watch with fascinated eyes as the Honorable Timothy reclaimed the note and wrote across its damning face, Miss Green may come too. She is not fired. T.O.S. Here, boy, he called. Take this to your teacher. The puzzled messenger turned to obey, and the associate superintendent saw that, though his dignity had suffered, his power had increased. To the list of those whom he might, 
if so disposed, devour, he had now added the name of the principal, who was quick to understand that an unpleasant investigation lay before him. If Miss Bailey could not be held responsible for this system of inter-classroom communication, it was clear that the principal could. Every trace of interest had left Mr. O'Shea's voice as he asked, Can they read? Oh, yes, they read, responded the teacher, but her spirit was crushed and the children reflected her depression. Still, they were marvelously good and that blundering note had said, Discipline is his lay. Well, here he had it. There was one spectator of this drama who, understanding no word nor instant therein, yet dismissed no shade of the many emotions which had stirred the light face of his lady. Toward the front of the room sat Morris Mogolowski, with every nerve tuned to teachers, and with an appreciation of the situation in which the other children had no share. On the afternoon of one of those dreary days of waiting for the evil which had now come, teacher had endeavored to explain the nature and possible result of this ordeal to her favorite. It was clear to him now that she was troubled, and he held the large and unaccustomed presence of the company mit the whiskers responsible. Countless generations of ancestors had followed and fostered the instinct which now led Morris to propitiate an angry power. Luckily, he was prepared with an offering of a suitable nature. He had meant to enjoy it for yet a few days, and then to give it to teacher. She was such a sensible person about presents. One might give her one's most cherished possession with a brave and cordial heart, for on each Friday afternoon, she returned the gifts she had received during the week, and this with no abatement of gratitude. Morris rose stealthily, crept forward, and placed a bright blue bromo seltzer bottle in the fat hand which hung over the back of the chair of state. The hand closed instinctively as, with dawning curiosity, the Honorable Timothy studied the small figure at his side, it began in a wealth of loosely curling hair which shaded a delicate face, very pointed as to chin and monopolized by a pair of dark eyes, sad and deep and beautiful. A faded blue jumper was buttoned tightly across the narrow chest. Frayed trousers were precariously attached to the jumper, and impossible shoes and stockings supplemented the trousers. Glancing from boy to bottle, the company mit the whiskers asked what's this for for you what's in it a present mr o'shea removed the cork and proceeded to draw out incredible quantities of absorbent cotton when there was no more to come a faint tinkle sounded within the blue depths and mr o'shea reversing the bottle found himself possessed of a trampled and disfigured sleeve link of most palpable brass it's from gold, Morris assured him. You puts it in your, excuse me, shirt. Wish you help to wear it. Thank you, said the Honorable Tim, and there was a tiny break in the gloom which had enveloped him. And then, with a quick memory of the note and of his anger, Miss Bailey, who is this young man? And teacher, of whose hobbies Morris was one, answered warmly, That is Morris Mogluski the best of boys. He takes care of the goldfish, and does all sorts of things for me. Don't you, dear? Teacher, yes, ma'am, Morris answered. I'm loving much meet you. I gives presents on the company over you. Ain't he rather big to speak such broken English? asked Mr. O'Shea. I hope you remember that it is part of your duty to stamp out the dialect. Yes, I know. Miss Bailey answered, but Morris has been in America for so short a time. Nine months, is it not? Teacher, yes, ma'am. I come out of Russia, responded Morris, on the verge of tears, and his face buried in teacher's dress. Now, Mr. O'Shea had his prejudices strong and deep. He had been given jurisdiction over that particular district because it was his native heath, and the Board of Education considered that he would be more in sympathy with the 
inhabitants than a stranger. The truth was absolutely the reverse. Because he had spent his early years in a large old house on East Broadway, because he now saw his birthplace changed to a squalid tenement, and the happy hunting grounds of his youth grown ragged and foreign, swarming with strange faces and noisy with strange tongues, Mr. O'Shea bore a sullen grudge against the usurping race. He resented the caressing air with which Teacher held the little hand, placed so confidently within her own, and he welcomed the opportunity of gratifying his still ruffled temper and his racial antagonism at the same time. He would take a rise out of this young woman about her little Jew. She would be comforted later on. Mr. O'Shea rather fancied himself in the role of comforter when the sufferer was neither old nor ill-favored and so he set about creating the distress which he would later change to gratitude and joy. Assuredly, the Honorable Timothy had a well-developed sense of humor. "'His English is certainly dreadful,' remarked the voice of authority, and it was not an English voice, nor is O'Shea distinctively an English name. "'Dreadful! And by the way, I hope you are not spoiling these youngsters. You must remember that you are fitting them for the battle of life.' Don't coddle your soldiers. Can you reconcile your present attitude with discipline? With Morris, yes, teacher answered. He is gentle and tractable beyond words. Well, I hope you're right, grunted Mr. O'Shea. But don't coddle them. And so the instant closed. The sleeve link was tucked before Morris's yearning eyes into the reluctant pocket of the wide white waistcoat and Morris returned to his place. He found his reader and the proper page, and the lesson went on with brisk serenity, real on the children's part, but bravely assumed on teachers. Child after child stood up, read, sat down again, and it came to be the duty of Bertha Benderwitz to read the entire page of which the others had each read a line. She began jubilantly, but soon stumbled, hesitated, and wailed. Stands a fierce word. I don't know what it is. And teacher turned to write the puzzling word upon the blackboard. Morris's heart stopped with a sickening suddenness and then rushed madly on again. He had a new and dreadful duty to perform. All his mother's counsel, all his father's precepts told him that it was his duty. Yet fear held him in his little seat behind his little desk while his conscience insisted on this unalterable decree of the social code. So somebody's clothes is wrong, it's polite you says excuse and tells it out. And here was teacher, whom he dearly loved, whose ideals of personal adornment extended to full sets of buttons on jumpers and to laces in both shoes. Here was his immaculate lady fair in urgent need of assistance and advice, and all because she had, on that day, inaugurated a delightfully vigorous exercise for which, architecturally, she was not designed. There was yet room for hope that someone else would see the breach and brave the danger, but no. The visitor sat stolidly in the chair of state. The principal sat serenely beside him. The children sat each in his own little place behind his own little desk, keeping his own little eyes on his own little book. No, Morris's soul cried with Hamlet's. The time is out of joint, O oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. Up into the quiet air went his timid hand. Teacher, knowing him in his more garrulous moods, ignored the threatened interruption of Bertha's spirited resume. But the windmill action of the little arm attracted the Honorable Tim's attention. "'The best of boys wants you,' he suggested, and teacher perforce asked. "'Well, Morris, what is it?' Not until he was on his feet did the monitor of the goldfish bowl appreciate the enormity of the mission he had undertaken. The other children began to understand and watched his struggle for words and breath with sympathy or derision, as their natures prompted. But there are no words in which one may politely mention ineffective safety pens to one's glass of fashion. 
Morris's knees trembled queerly. His breathing grew difficult, and Teacher seemed a great way off as she asked again, "'Well, what is it, dear?' Morris panted a little, smiled weakly, and then sat down. Teacher was evidently puzzled, the company alert, the principal uneasy. "'Now, Morris,' Teacher remonstrated, "'you must tell me what you want.' But Morris had deserted his etiquette and his veracity, and murmured only, "'Nothing's—' "'Just wanted to be noticed,' said the Honorable Tim. "'It is easy to spoil them.' And he watched the best of boys rather closely, for a habit of interrupting reading lessons, wantonly and without reason, was a trait in the young of which he disapproved. When this disapprobation manifested itself in Mr. O'Shea's countenance, the loyal heart of Morris interpreted it as a new menace to his sovereign. No later than yesterday she had warned them of the vital importance of coherence. Everyone knows, she had said, that only common little boys and girls come apart. No one ever likes them. And the big stranger was even now misjudging her. Again his short arm agitated the quiet air, again his trembling legs upheld a trembling boy. Again authority urged, again teacher asked. Well, Mars, what is it, dear? All this was as before, but not as before was poor harassed Miss Bailey's swoop down the aisle, her sudden taking Morris's troubled little face between her soft hands the quick near meeting with her kind eyes, the note of pleading in her repetition. What do you want, Morris? He was beginning to answer when it occurred to him that the truth might make her cry. There was an unsteadiness about her upper lip which seemed to indicate the possibility. Suddenly he found that he no longer yearned for words in which to tell her of her disjointment, but for something else, anything else, to say. His miserable eyes escaped from hers and wandered to the wall in desperate search for conversation. There was no help in the pictures, no inspiration in the plaster casts, but on the blackboard he read, Tuesday, January 21st, 1902. Only the date, but he must make it serve. With teacher close beside him, with a hostile eye of the Honorable Tim upon him, hedged round about by the frightened or admiring regard of the first reader class. Morris blinked rapidly, swallowed resolutely, and remarked, Teacher, this year's nineteen hundred and two, and knew that all was over. The caressing clasp of teacher's hands grew into a grip of anger. The countenance of Mr. O'Shea took on the beautiful expression of the prophet who has found honor and verification in his own country. The best of boys has his off days, and this is one of them, he remarked. Morris, said teacher, did you stop a reading lesson to tell me that? Do you think I don't know what the year is? I'm ashamed of you. Never had she spoken thus. If the telling had been difficult to Morris, when she was glad on him, it was impossible now that she was a prey to such evident mad feelings. And yet he must make some explanation. So he murmured, Teacher, I tell you, excuse. I know you knows what year stands. Only it's polite I tells you something. And I had afraid. And so you bothered your teacher with that nonsense, said Tim. You're a nice boy. Morris's eyes were hardly more appealing than teachers as the two culprits, for so they felt themselves, turned to their judge. Morris is a strange boy, Miss Bailey explained. He can't be managed by ordinary methods. And extraordinary methods don't seem to work today, Mr. O'Shea interjected. And I think teacher continued, that it might be better not to press the point. Oh, if you have no control over him, Mr. O'Shea was beginning pleasantly, when the principal suggested, 
you'd better let us hear what he has to say, Miss Bailey. Make him understand that you are master here. And teacher, with a heart-sick laugh at the irony of this advice in the presence of the associate superintendent, turned to obey. But Morris would utter no words but these, dozens of times repeated. I have afraid. Miss Bailey coaxed, bribed, threatened, and controlled, shook him surreptitiously, petted him openly. The result was always the same. It's polite I tells you something out, only I had afraid. But Morris, dear, of what? cried teacher. Are you afraid of me? Stop crying now and answer. Are you afraid of Miss Bailey? No, man. Are you afraid of the principal? No, man. Are you afraid? With a slight pause, during which a native hue of honesty was foully done to death. Of the kind gentleman we are all so glad to see? No, man. Well, then, what is the matter with you? Are you sick? Don't you think you would like to go home to your mother? No, man, I ain't sick. I tells you excuse. The repeated imitation of a sorrowful goat was too much for the Honorable Tim. Bring that boy to me, he commanded. I'll show you how to manage refractory and rebellious children. With much difficulty and many assurances that the gentleman was not going to hurt him, Miss Bailey succeeded in untwining Morris's legs from the supports of the desk, and in half-carrying, half-leading him up to the chair of state. An ominous silence had settled over the room. Eva Gonorowsky was weeping softly, and the redoubtable Isidore Applebaum was stiffened in a frozen calm. Morris! began the associate superintendent in his most awful tones. Will you tell me why you raised your hand? Come here, sir. Teacher urged him gently, and like dog to heel, he went. He halted within a pace or two of Mr. O'Shea, and lifted a beseeching face toward him. I couldn't to tell nothing out, said he. I tells you excuse. I got afraid. The Honorable Tim lunged quickly and caught the terrified boy preparatory to shaking him but morris escaped and fled to his haven of safety his teacher's arms when miss bailey felt the quick clasp of the thin little hands the heavy beating of the overtired heart and the deep convulsive sobs she turned on the honorable timothy o'shea and spoke i must ask you to leave this room at once she announced the principal started and then sat back. Teacher's eyes were dangerous, and the Honorable Tim might profit by a lesson. You frighten the child until he can't breathe. I can do nothing with him while you remain. The examination is ended. You may go. Now Mr. O'Shea saw he had gone a little too far in his effort to create the proper dramatic setting for his clemency. He had not expected the young woman to rise quite so far and high. His deprecating half-apology, half-eulogy, gave Morris the opportunity he craved. Teacher, he panted, I want to whisper mit you in the ear. With a dexterous movement, he knelt upon her lap and tore out his solitary safety pin. He then clasped her tightly and made his explanation. He began in the softest of whispers, which increased in volume as it did in interest, so that he reached the climax at the full power of his boy soprano voice. Teacher, Mrs. Bailey, I know you what gear stands, only it's polite I tells you something, and I had afraid the while the company mit the whiskers sets on the rubbers. But, teacher, it's like this, your jumper sticking out, and you could to take my safety pin. He had understood so little of all that had passed that he was beyond being surprised by the result of his communication. Miss Bailey had gathered him into her arms and had cried in a queer, helpless way, and as she cried, 
she had said over and over again, Morris, how could you? Oh, how could you, dear? How could you? The principal and the company of Mitho Viskers looked solemnly at one another for a struggling moment, and had then broken into laughter, long and loud, until the visiting authority was limp and moist. The children waited in polite uncertainty, but when Miss Bailey, after some indecision, had contributed a wan smile which later grew into a shaky laugh, the first reader class went wild. Then the Honorable Timothy arose to say good-bye. He reiterated his praise of the singing and reading, the blackboard work, and the moral tone. An awkward pause ensued, during which the principal engaged the young Gonorowskis in impromptu conversation. The Honorable Tim crossed over to Miss Bailey's side and steadied himself for a great effort. Teacher, he began meekly, I tell you, Scoos, this sort of thing makes a man feel like a bull in a china shop. Do you think the little fellow will shake hands with me? I was really only joking. But surely he will, said Miss Bailey, as she glanced down at the tangle of dark curls resting against her breast. Morris, dear, aren't you going to say good-bye to the gentleman? Morris relaxed one hand from its grasp on his lady and bestowed it on Mr. O'Shea. Good-bye, he said gently. I gives you presents, from gold presents, the while your friends met teacher. I'm loving much meet her, too. At this moment, the principal turned, and Mr. O'Shea, in a desperate attempt to retrieve his dignity, began, as to class management and discipline. But the principal was not to be deceived. Don't you think, Mr. O'Shea, said he, that you and I had better leave the management of the little ones to the women? You have noticed, perhaps, that this is nature's method. End of Morris and the Honorable Tim by Myra Kelly Zut by Guy Wetmore Carroll for the 1903 collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Zut by Guy Wetmore Carroll. Side by side, on the Avenue de la Grande Armée, stand the epicerie of the Jean-Baptiste Caire and the <laughs> Salle de Coiffure of Hippolyte Sergeot. And between these two, there is a great gulf fixed, the which has come to be through the acerbity of Alexandrine Caire, according to Espérance Sergeot, through the duplicity of Espérance Sergeot, according to Alexandre Calais. But the veritable root of all evil is Zut, and Zut sits smiling in Jean Baptiste's doorway, and cares not for anything in the world, save the sunlight and her midday meal. When Hippolyte found himself in a position to purchase the salle de coiffure, he gave evidence of marked acumen by uniting himself in the holy and civil bonds of matrimony with a retiring patron's daughter whose dot ran into the coveted five figures, and whose heart, said Hippolyte, was as good as her face was pretty, which, even by the unprejudiced, was acknowledged to be forcible commendation. The installation of the new establishment was a nine days' wonder in the courtier. It is a busy thoroughfare at its western end, is the Avenue de la Grande Armée crowded with bicyclists and with a multitude of creatures, fearfully and wonderfully clad, who do incomprehensible things in connection with motor carriages. Also, there are big cafés in plenty, whose waiters must be smoothly shaven, and, moreover, at the time when Hippolyte came into his own, the Port Mayotte station of the Metropolitan had already pushed its entree and sortie up through the soil not a hundred meters from his door 
where they stood like atrocious yellow tulips, art nouveau, breathing people out and in by thousands. There was no lack of possible custom. The problem was to turn possible into probable and probable into permanent, and here the seven wits and the ten thousand francs of Esperance came prominently to the fore. She it was who sounded the progressive note, which is half the secret of success. Pour attirer les gens, she said, with her arms akimbo, il faut d'abord la sepeta. In her creed, all that was worth doing, at all, was worth doing gloriously. So, under her guidance, Hippolyte journeyed from shop to shop in the Faubourg Saint Antoine, and spent hours of impassioned argument with carpenters and decorators. In the end, the salle de coiffure was glorified by fresh paint without and within and by the addition of a long mirror in a gilt frame and a complicated apparatus of gleaming nickel plate which went by the imposing title of appareil antiseptique and the acquisition of which was duly proclaimed by a special placard that swung at right angles to the door the shop was rechristened too and the black and white sign across its front which formerly bore the simple inscription Kibber, Weffier, now blazoned abroad the vastly more impressive legend, Salon, Malakoff. The window shelves fairly groaned beneath their burden of soaps, toilet waters, and perfumery. A string of bright yellow sponges occupied each corner of the window, and through the agency of white enamel letters on the pane itself, Public attention was drawn to the apparently contradictory facts that English was spoken and shampooing given within. Then Hippolyte engaged two assistants and clad them in white duck jackets, and his wife fabricated a new blouse of blue silk and seated herself behind the desk with an engaging smile. The enterprise was fairly launched and experience was not slow in proving the theories of Esperance to be well-founded. The courtier was épat from the start, and took with enthusiasm the bait held forth. The affairs of the Salon Malakoff prospered prodigiously. But there is a serpent in every Eden, and in that of the Sergeant, this role was assumed by Alexandrine Kett, the worthy Apicier himself was of too torpid a temperament to fall a victim to the gnawing tooth of envy, but in the soul of his wife, the launch, and, what was worse, the immediate prosperity of the Salon Malakoff, bred dire resentment. Her own establishment had grown grimy with the passage of time, and the annual profits displayed a constant and disturbing tendency toward complete evaporation, since the coming of the big cafés and the resultant subversion of custom to the wholesale dealers. This persistent narrowing of the former appreciable gap between purchase and selling price rankled in Alexandrine's mind, but her misguided efforts to maintain the percentage of profit by recourse to inferior qualities only made bad worse. And even as the Sergeot were steering the Salon Malakoff forth upon the waters of prosperity, there were nightly conferences in the household next door, at which impending ruin presided, and exasperation is sounded, the keynote of every sentence. The resplendent façade of Hippolyte's establishment, the tide of custom, which poured into and out of his door the loudly expressed admiration of his ability and thrift which greeted her ears on every side and finally the sight of esperance fresh smiling and prosperous behind her little counter all these were as gall and wormwood to alexandrine brooding over her accumulating debts and her decreasing earnings among her dusty stacks of jars and boxes once she had called upon her neighbor, somewhat for courtesy's sake, but more for curiosities, and since then the agreeable scent of violet and lilac 
perfumery dwelt always in her memory and mirages of scrupulously polished nickel and glass hung always before her eyes the air of her own shop was heavy with the pungent odors of raw vegetables cheeses and dried fish and no brilliance redeemed the sardine and biscuit boxes which surrounded her life became a bitter thing to alexandrine Kaye, for if nothing is more gratifying than one's own success surely nothing is less so than that of one's neighbor moreover her visit had never been returned and this again was fuel for her rage but the sharpest thorn in her flesh and even in that of her phlegmatic husband was the base desertion to the enemy's camp of abel flic in the days when madame kelly was unmarried and when her ninety kilos were fifty still abel had been youngest commis in the very shop over which she now held sway and the most devoted suitor in all her train even after his prowess in the black days of seventy one had won him the attention of the civil authorities and a grateful municipality had transformed the grocer soldier into a guardian of law and order he still hung upon the favor of his heart's first love and only gave up the struggle when jean baptiste bore off the prize and enthroned her in state as presiding genius of his newly acquired epicere later an unwittingly kindly prefect had transferred abel to the seventeenth arrondissement and so the old friendship was picked up where it had been dropped and the ruddy-faced agent found it both convenient and agreeable to drop in frequently at madame Kelly's on his way home and exchange a few words of reminiscence or banter for a box of sardines or a minute package of tea but with the deterioration of his old friend's wares and the almost simultaneous appearance of the salon malakoff his loyalty wavered flick sampled the advantages of hippolyte's establishment and being won over thereby returned again and again his hearty laugh came to be heard almost daily in the salle de coiffure and because he was a brave homme and a good customer he did not stand upon a question of a few sous but allowed hippolyte to work his will and trim and curl and perfume him to his heart's content there was always a welcome for him and a smile for madame Sergeot, and occasionally a little present of brilliantine or perfumery for friendship's sake and because it is well to have the good will of the all-powerful police from her window, Madame Kelly observed the comings and goings of Abel with a resentful eye. It was rarely now that he glanced into the epicery as he passed, and still more rarely that he greeted his former flame with a stiff nod. Once she had hailed him from the doorway, sardines in hand, but he had replied that he was pressed for time, and had passed rapidly on. Then, indeed, did blackness descend upon the soul of alexandrine and in her deepest consciousness she vowed to have her revenge neither the occasion nor the method was as yet clear to her but she pursed her lips ominously and bided her time in the existence of madame kelly there was one empathetic consolation for all misfortunes the which was none other than zut a white angora cat of surpassing beauty and prodigious size she had come into alexandrine's possession as a kitten and what with much eating and an inherent distaste for exercise had attained her present proportions and her superb air of unconcern it was from the latter that she derived her name the which in parisian argot at once means everything and nothing but is chiefly taken to signify complete and magnificent indifference to all things mundane and material and in the matter of indifference zot was past mistress even for madame calais herself who fed her with the choicest morsels from her own plate brushed her fine fur with excessive care 
and addressed caressing remarks to her at minute intervals throughout the day. Zut manifested a lack of interest that amounted to contempt. As she basked in the warm sun at the shop door, the round face of her mistress beamed upon her from the little desk, and the voice of her mistress sent fulsome flattery winging toward her on the heavy air. Was she beautiful, mon Dieu? In effect, all that one could dream of the most beautiful, and her eyes of a blue like the heaven, were they not wise and calm? Mon Dieu, yes! It was a cat among thousands, a mimi almost divine. Jean-Baptiste, appealed to for confirmation of these statements, replied that it was so. There was no denying that this was a magnificent beast, and of a chic, and caressing, which was exaggeration, and of an affection, which was doubtful, and courageous, which was wholly untrue. Mazette, yes, a cat of cats. And was the boy to be the whole afternoon in delivering a cheese he demanded of her and madame Kelly would challenge him to ask her that but it was a good great beast all the same and so bury herself again in her accounts until her attention was once more drawn to zut and fresh flattery poured forth for all of this zut cared less than nothing in the midst of her mistress's sweetest cajolery she simply closed her sapphire eyes with an inexpressibly eloquent air of weariness, or turned to the intricacies of her toilet, as who should say, Continue, I am listening, but it is unimportant. But long familiarity with her disdain had deprived it of any sting, so far as Alexandrine was concerned. Passive indifference she could suffer. It was only when Zut proceeded to an active manifestation of ingratitude that she inflicted an irremediable wound. Returning from her marketing one morning, Madame Calais discovered her graceless favorite seated complacently in the doorway of the Salon Malakoff, and in a paroxysm of indignation bore down upon her and snatched her to her breast. Unhappy one! she cried, planting herself in full view of Esperance, and, while raining the letter of her reproach upon the truant, contriving to apply its spirit wholly to her neighbor. What hast thou done? Is it that thou desertest me for strangers who may destroy thee? Name of a name, hast thou no heart? They would steal thee from me, and, above all, now, well then, no, one shall see if such things are permitted. Vagabond! And with this parting shot, which passed harmlessly over the head of the offender, and launched itself full at Madame Sergeot, the outraged epicerie flounced back into her own domain, where, turning, she threatened the empty air with a passionate gesture. Vagabond! she repeated good for nothing it is not enough to have robbed me of my friends that you must steal my child as well we shall see then suddenly softening thou art beautiful and good and wise mon dieu if i should lose thee and above all now now there existed a market if unvoiced community of feeling between esperance and her resentful neighbor for the former's passion for cats was more consuming even than the latter's. She had long cherished the dream of possessing a white angora, and when, that morning, of her own accord, Zut stepped into the salon Malakoff, she was received with demonstrations even warmer than those to which she had long since become accustomed. And, whether it was the novelty of her surroundings or merely some unwanted instinct, which made her unusually susceptible. Her habitual indifference then and there gave place to animation, and her satisfaction was vented in her long, appreciative purr, wherewith it was not once a year that she vouchsafed to gladden her owner's heart. Esperance hastened to prepare a saucer of milk, and when this was exhausted, 
added a generous portion of fish, and Zut then made a tour of the shop, rubbing herself against the chair legs and receiving the homage of customers and duck-clad assistants alike. Fleek, his ruddy face screwed into a mere knot of features, as Hippolyte worked violet hair tonic into his brittle locks, was moved to satire by the apparition. Tiens, it is with the cat as with the clients. All the world forsakes the cat. Strangely enough, the wrathful words of Alexandrine, as she snatched her darling from the doorway, awoke in the mind of Esperance her first suspicion of this smouldering resentment. Absorbed in the launching of her husband's affairs, and constantly employed in the making of change, and with the keeping of her simple accounts, she had had no time to bestow upon her neighbors, and, even had her attention been free, she could hardly have been expected to deduce the rancor of Madame Kell from the evidence at hand. But even if she had been able to ignore the significance of that furious outburst at her very door, its meaning had not been lost upon the others, and her own half-formed conviction was speedily confirmed. "'What has she?' cried Hippolyte, pausing in the final stage of his operations upon the highly perfumed fleek. "'Do I know?' replied his wife with a shrug. "'She thinks I stole her cat. I!' "'Quite simply, she hates you,' puts in fleek. "'And why not? She is old.' and fat, and her business is taking itself off, like that. You are young, and, with a bow, as he rose, beautiful, and your affairs march to a marvel. She is jealous, c'est tout. It is a bad character, that. But, mon Dieu! But what does that say to you? Let her go her way, she and her cat. Au revoir, sir, madame. Au revoir. Sir, that, and, rattling a couple of sous into the little urn reserved for tips, the policeman took his departure, amid a chorus of Merci, monsieur, au revoir, monsieur, from Hippolyte and his duck-clad aides. But what he had said remained behind. All day Madame Sigeau pondered upon the incident of the morning and Abel Flick's comments thereupon seeking out some more plausible reason for this hitherto unsuspected enmity than the mere contrast between her material conditions and those of madame kale seemed to her to afford for to a natural placidity of temperament which manifested itself in a reluctance to incur the displeasure of any one had been lately added in esperance a shrewd commercial instinct which told her that the fortunes of the Salon Malakoff might readily be imperiled by an unfriendly tongue. In the quartier, gossip spread quickly and took deep root. It was quite imaginably within the power of Madame Calais to circulate such rumors of Sergio dishonesty as should draw their lately won custom from them and leave but empty chairs and discontent where now all was prosperity and satisfaction suddenly there came to her the memory of that visit which she had never returned mon dieu and was not that reason enough she the youngest patron in the quartier to ignore deliberately the friendly call of a neighbor at least it was not too late to make amends so when business lagged a little in the late afternoon madame Sergeot slipped from her desk and after a furtive touch to her hair went in next door to pour oil upon the troubled waters madame kale throned at her counter received her visitor with unexampled frigidity ah it is you she said you have come to make some purchases no doubt eggs madame answered her visitor disconcerted but tactfully accepting the hint the best quality or demanded alexandrine with the suggestion of a sneer the best evidently madame six if you please spring weather at last 
it would seem. To this generality, the other made no reply. Descending from her stool, she blew sharply into a small paper bag, thereby distending it into a miniature balloon, and began selecting the eggs from a basket, holding each one to the light, and then dusting it with exaggerated care before placing it in the bag. While she was thus employed, Zot advanced from a secluded corner, and, stretching her forelegs slowly to their utmost length, greeted her acquaintance of the morning with a yawn. Finding in the cat an outlet for her embarrassment, Esperance made another effort to give the interview a friendly turn. He is beautiful, madame, your matou, she said. It is a female, replied madame Kelly, turning abruptly from the basket, and she does not care for strangers. The second snub was not calculated to encourage neighborly overtures, but madame Sergeot had felt herself to be in the wrong, and was not to be so readily repulsed. We do not see Monsieur Calais at the Salon Malakoff, she continued. We should be enchanted. My husband shaves himself, retorted Alexandrine, with renewed dignity. But his hair, ventured Esperance. I cut it, thundered her foe. Here, Madame Sergeot made a false move. She laughed. Then, in confusion, and striving too late to retrieve herself. Pardon, madame, she added, but it seems droll to me. That, after all, ten sous is a sum so small. All the world, unfortunately, broke in madame Kelly, has not the wherewithal to buy mirrors and pay itself frescoes and apparels and antiseptiques. The eggs are twenty-four sous. But we do not pride ourselves upon our eggs. Perhaps you had better seek them elsewhere for the future. For sole reply, Madame Sergeot had recourse to her expressive shrug, and then, laying two francs upon the counter, and gathering up the sous which Alexandrine rather hurled at than handed her, she took her way toward the door with all the dignity at her command but madame calais feeling her snub to have been insufficient could not let her go without a final thrust perhaps your husband will be so amiable as to shampoo my cat she shouted she seems to like your salon but esperance while for concord's sake inclined to tolerate all rudeness to herself was not prepared to hear hippolyte insulted and so wheeling at the doorway flung all her resentment into two words. Mais élevé. Yes, screamed Alexandrine from the desk, and so they parted. Now, even at this stage, an armed truce might still have been preserved, had Zut been content with the evil she had wrought, and not thought it incumbent upon her further to embitter a quarrel that was a very pretty quarrel as it stood. But whether it was that the milk and fish of the Salon Malakoff lay sweeter upon her memory than any of the familiar dainties in the Epicerie Calais, or that, by her unknowable feline instinct, she was irresistibly drawn toward the scent of violet and lilac brilliantine, her first visit to the Sergeot was soon repeated, and from this visit other visits grew, until it was almost a daily occurrence for her to saunter slowly into the Salle de Coiffure, and there receive the food and homage which were rendered as her undisputed due. For, whatever was the bitterness of Esperance toward Madame Calais, no part thereof descended upon Zut. On the contrary, at each visit, her heart was more drawn toward the sleek Angora and her desire, but strengthened to possess her peer. But white Angoras are a luxury, and an expensive one at that, and, however prosperous the Salon Malakoff might be, its proprietors were not as yet in a position to squander eighty francs upon a whim. So, 
until profits should mount higher madame sergeot was forced to content herself with the voluntary visits of her neighbor's pet madame kelly did not yield her rights of sovereignty without a struggle on the occasion of zot's third visit she descended upon the salon malakoff robed in wrath and found the adored one contentedly feeding on fish in the very bosom of the family sergeot an appalling scene ensued if she stormed crimson of countenance and threatening esperance with her fist if you must entice my cat from her home at least i will thank you not to give her food i provide all that is necessary and for the rest how do i know what is in that saucer and she surveyed the duck-clad assistants and the astounded customers with tremendous scorn you others she added I ask you, is it just? These people take my cat and feed her. Feed her? With I know not what. It is overwhelming, unheard of, and above all, now! But here the peaceful Hippolyte played trumps. It is the privilege of the vulgar, he cried, advancing razor in hand, when they are at home to insult their neighbors. But here not my wife has told me of you and your sayings beware or i shall arrange your affair for you go you and your cat and by way of emphasis he fairly kicked zut into her astonished owner's arms he was magnificent was hippolyte this anecdote duly elaborated was poured into the ears of abel flick an hour later and that evening he paid his first visit in many months to Madame Calais. She greeted him effusively, being willing to pardon all the past for the sake of regaining this powerful friend. But the glitter in the agent's eye would have cowed a fiercer spirit than hers. "'You amuse yourself,' he said sternly, looking straight at her, over the handful of raisins which she tendered him. "'By wearying my friends,' I counsel you to take care. One does not sell inferior eggs in Paris without hearing of it sooner or later. I know more than I have told, but not more than I can tell, if I choose. Our ancient friendship, faltered Alexandrine, touched in a vulnerable spot. Preserves you thus far, added Flick, no less unmoved. Beware how you abuse it. And so the calls of Zot were no longer disturbed. But the rover spirit is progressive, and thus short visits became long visits, and finally the Angora spent whole nights in the Salon Malakoff, where a box and a bit of carpet were provided for her. And one fateful morning, the meaning of Madame Calais's significant words, and above all, now, was made clear. The prosperity of Hippolyte's establishment had grown apace, so that, on the morning in question, the three chairs were occupied, and yet other customers awaited their turn. The air was laden with violet and lilac. A stout chauffeur in a leather suit, thickly coated with dust, was undergoing a shampoo at the hands of one of the duck-clad, and under the skillfully plied razor of the other the virgin down slid from the lips and chin of a slim and somewhat startled youth while from a vaporizer hippolyte played a fine spray of perfumed water upon the ruddy countenance of abel flick it was an eloquent moment eminently fitted for some dramatic incident and that dramatic incident zut supplied she advanced slowly, and, with an air of conscious dignity from the corner, where was her carpeted box? And in her mouth was a limp something, which, when deposited in the immediate center of the Salon Malakoff, resolved itself into an angora kitten, as white as snow. Epitant, said Flick, mopping his perfumed chin. 
and so it was. There was an immediate investigation of Zut's quarters, which revealed four other kittens. But each of these was marked with black or tan. It was the flower of the flock with which the proud mother had won her public. And they are all yours, cried Flick, when the question of ownership arose. Mon Dieu, yes. There was such a case not a month ago in the 8th arrondissement, a concierge of the Avenue Hoche, who made a contrary claim. But the courts decided against her. They are all yours, Madame Sergeot. My felicitations. Now, as we have said, Madame Sergeot was of a placid temperament, which sought not strife. But the unprovoked insults of Madame Calais had struck deep, and, after all, she was but human. So it was that, seated at her little desk, she composed the following masterpiece of satire. Chère madame, we send you back your cat, and the others, all but one. One kitten was of a pure white, more beautiful even than its mother. As we have long desired a white angora, we keep this one as a souvenir of you. We regret that we do not see the means of accepting the kind offer you were so amiable as to make us. We fear that we shall not find time to shampoo your cat, as we shall be so busy taking care of our own. Monsieur Flick will explain the rest. We pray you to accept, madame, the assurance of our distinguished consideration. Hippolyte and Esperance, Sergeot. It was Abel Flick who conveyed the above epistle and Zot and four of Zot's kittens to Alexandrine Calais, and when that wrathful person would have rent him with tooth and nail, it was Abel Flick who laid his finger on his lip and said, Concern yourself with the superior kitten, madam, and I concern myself with the inferior eggs. To which Alexandrine made no reply. After Fleck had taken his departure, she remained speechless for five consecutive minutes for the first time in the whole of her waking existence, gazing at the spot at her feet where sprawled the white angora surrounded by her mottled offspring. Even when the first shock of her defeat had passed, she simply heaved a deep sigh and uttered two words, <sighs> oh, zut! The which, in Parisian argot, at once means everything and nothing. End of Zut by Guy Wetmore Carroll Three Poems by Rainer Maria Rilke for the 1903 collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Three Poems from the Book of Poverty and Death. Her mouth is like the mouth of a fine bust that cannot utter sound nor breathe nor kiss but that had once from life received all this which shaped its subtle curves and ever must from fullness of past knowledge dwell alone a thing apart a parable in stone two alone thou wanderest through space profound one with a hidden face thou art poverty's great rose the eternal metamorphose of gold into the light of sun thou art the mystic homeless one into the world thou never came too mighty thou too great to name voice of the storm song that the wild wind sings thou harp 
that shatters those who play thy strings. 3. A watcher of thy spaces, make me a listener at thy stone. Give to me vision, and then wake me upon thy oceans all alone. Thy river's courses let me follow, where they leap, the crags in their flight, and where at dusk in caverns hollow they crooned music of the night. Send me far into thy barren land, where the snow clouds the wild wind drives, where monasteries like grey shrouds stand august symbols of unlived lives there pilgrims climb slowly one by one and behind them a blind man goes with him i will walk till day is done up the pathway that no one knows end of three poems from the book of poverty and death by rainer maria rilke Translated by Jesse Lamont The Schoolmarm Saddle Horse by Frank Benton From Cowboy Life on the Sidetrack For the 1903 Collection This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Reading by Matt Perard The Schoolmarm's Saddle Horse by Frank Benton one day, while waiting on a sidetrack, old truck wagon got to tellin' about the new school marm in their neighborhood. He said he reckoned she was as high educated as anybody ever got. He said she didn't say cowpuncher talk much, but she used some mighty high-sounded words. Why, he said, she called a water gap a water yawn, a shindig a daunce, engines navarigines, cowboys cow servants and bill allen's hired girl where she boards a domestic the first time she came to bill allen's she heard them a talkin about cow punchers and she asked old bill if he wouldn't show her a real live cow puncher and there weren't any cow punchers in boston where she came from and old bill said he'd have one over from the nearest cow ranch next day so next morning he comes over to my ranch and tells me to rig out in fur snaps, put on my buckskin shirt and big Mexican hat with tassels on it, with red silk handkerchief around my neck, and he would take me over and introduce me to the new school marm. So I rigged up all proper, and when we got over to Bill Allen's place, old Bill told his wife to go to the school marm's room and tell her he had a genuine cowpuncher out there, and for her to come out and see him. She told Mrs. Allen she was busy just then, but tell Mr. Allen to take the cowpuncher to the barn and give him some hay and she would be out directly. Now, he'd been wondering ever since, old Chuck said, what on earth she reckoned a cowpuncher was. Still, she was mighty green about some things, because when they had a little party at old Bill Allen's, all the girls got to telling about the breed of their saddle horses, and some said their hoss was a Hamiltonian, and some said their hoss was thoroughbred, and some was Black Hawk Morgan. The school marm said she had a gentleman friend in Boston who had a very fine saddle hoss of the stallion breed, and when the boys giggled and the gals began to look red, she says, as innocent as a lamb, there is such a breed of hosses, ain't they? Of course, she says, I know it's a rare breed, and perhaps you folks out here never saw any of that breed. She says, they are great hosses to Winnie. Why, my friend's hoss kept winning all the time. When she got to describing that hoss's habits, of course all us boys begun to back up and get out the room. I reckon she was from an Irish family, because she insisted Mrs. Flanagan was right when she called the station a depot. But I reckon she could just knock the hind sights off anybody when it came to singing. I never did know just whether it was a song or not she was sung, because none of us could understand it. She said it was Italian, and of course there wasn't any of us understood any Dago talk, but she would just commence away down in a kind of low growl, like a sleeping foxhound when he is dreaming of a bear fight 
and keep growling a little louder and a little louder and directly begin to give some short barks and then it would sound like a herd of wild cattle bawling round a dead carcass then like a lot of hungry coyotes howling of a clear frosty night and finally wind up like hundreds of wild geese flying high and going south for winter she said her voice had been cultivated and i reckon it had you could tell it had been laid off and mighty even rose the weeds all pulled out and the dirt throwed up close to the hills but somehow i'd a heap rather hear a little blue-eyed girl i know up in the mountains of idaho sing the suwanee river and coming through the rye cause i can understand that but i guess them boston girls are all right at home i reckon they are used to them there End of the School Marm Saddle Horse by Frank Benton. The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin by Beatrix Potter for the 1903 collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin. A Story for Nora by Beatrix Potter This is a tale about a tale, a tale that belonged to a little red squirrel, and his name was Nutkin. He had a brother called Twinkleberry, and a great many cousins. They lived in a wood at the edge of a lake. In the middle of the lake there is an island covered with trees and nut bushes, and amongst those trees stands a hollow oak tree which is the house of an owl who is called old brown one autumn when the nuts were ripe and the leaves on the hazel bushes were golden and green nutkin and twinkleberry and all the other little squirrels came out of the wood and down to the edge of the lake they made little rafts out of twigs and they paddled away over the water to owl island to gather nuts each squirrel had a little sack and a large oar and spread out his tail for a sail. They also took with them an offering of three fat mice as a present for Old Brown and put them down upon his doorstep. Then Twinkleberry and the other little squirrels each made a low bow and said politely, Old Mr. Brown, will you favor us with permission? to gather nuts upon your island? But Nutkin was excessively impertinent in his manners. He bobbed up and down like a little red cherry, singing, Riddle me, riddle me, rot tot tot a little wee man in a red, red coat, a staff in his hand, and a stone in his throat. If you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a groat. Now, this riddle is as old as the hills, Mr. Brown paid no attention, whatever, to Nutkin. He shut his eyes obstinately and went to sleep. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts and sailed away home in the evening. But next morning they all came back again to Owl Island, and Twinkleberry and the others brought a fine fat mole and laid it on the stone in front of old Brown's doorway and said, Mr. Brown, will you favor us with your gracious permission to gather some more nuts? But Nutkin, who had no respect, began to dance up and down, tickling old Mr. Brown with a nettle, and singing, Old Mr. B, riddle me re, hitty pitty within the wall, hitty pitty without the wall. If you touch hitty pitty, hitty pitty will bite you. Mr. Brown woke up suddenly and carried the mole into his house. He shut the door in Nutkin's face. Presently, a little thread of blue smoke from a wood fire came up from the top of the tree, and Nutkin peeped through the keyhole and sang, A house full, a hole full, and you cannot gather a bowl full. The squirrels searched for nuts all over the island and filled their little sacks, but Nutkin gathered oak apples yellow and scarlet and sat upon a beech stump playing marbles and watching the door of old mr brown 
On the third day, the squirrels got up very early and went fishing. They caught seven fat minnows as a present for Old Brown. They paddled over the lake and landed under a crooked chestnut tree on Owl Island. Twinkleberry and six other little squirrels each carried a fat minnow, but Nutkin, who had no nice manners, brought no present at all. He ran in front, singing. The man in the wilderness said to me, How many strawberries grow in the sea? I answered him, as I thought good, As many red herrings as grow in the wood. But old Mr. Brown took no interest in riddles, Not even when the answer was provided for him. On the fourth day, the squirrels brought a present Of six fat beetles, which were as good as plums In plum pudding for old Brown. Each beetle was wrapped up carefully in a dock leaf, fastened with a pine-needle pin. But Nutkin sang as rudely as ever. Old Mr. B, riddle me re, flower of England, fruit of Spain, met together in a shower of rain, put in a bag tied round with string, if you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a ring. Which was ridiculous of Nutkin because he had not got any ring to give to old brown the other squirrels hunted up and down the nut bushes but nutkin gathered robin's pin cushions off a briar bush and stuck them full of pine needle pins on the fifth day the squirrels brought a present of wild honey it was so sweet and sticky that they licked their fingers as they put it down upon the stone they had stolen it out of a bumblebee's nest on the tippity top of the hill. But Nutkin skipped up and down, singing, Hum a bum buzz buzz, hum a bum buzz. As I went over tipple time, I met a flock of bonny swine, some yellow knacked, some yellow backed. They were the very bonniest swine that e'er went over the tipple time. Old Mr. Brown turned up his eyes in disgust at the impertinence of Nutkin but he ate up the honey. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts, but Nutkin sat upon a big flat rock and played ninepins with a crab apple and green fir cones. On the sixth day, which was Saturday, the squirrels came again for the last time. They brought a new laid egg in a little rush basket as a last parting present for old Brown. But Nutkin ran in front, laughing and shouting, Humpty Dumpty lies in the beck with a white counterpane round his neck. Forty doctors and forty rights cannot put Humpty Dumpty to rights. Now old Mr. Brown took an interest in eggs. He opened one eye and shut it again, but still he did not speak. Nutkin became more and more impertinent. Old Mr. B, old Mr. B, hickamore, hackamore on the king's kitchen door. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't drive Hickamore, Hackamore, off the king's kitchen door. Nutkin danced up and down like a sunbeam, but still Old Brown said nothing at all. Nutkin began again. Author O'Bower has broken his band. He comes roaring up the land. The king of Scots, with all his power, cannot turn Arthur of the bower. Nutkin made a whirring noise to sound like the wind, and he took a running jump right on to the head of old Brown. Then, all at once, there was a flutterment and a scufflement and a loud squeak. The other squirrels scuttered away into the bushes. When they came back, very cautiously, peeping round the tree, there was old Brown sitting on his doorstep, quite still, with his eyes closed as if nothing had happened. But Nutkin was in his waistcoat pocket. This looks like the end of the story, but it isn't. Old Brown carried Nutkin into his house and held him up by the tail, intending to skin him. But Nutkin pulled so very hard that his tail broke in two, and he dashed up the staircase and escaped out of the attic window. And to this day, if you meet Nutkin up a tree and ask him a riddle, he will throw sticks at you and stamp his feet and scold and shout, Cuck, 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 
End of the Tale of Squirrel Nutkin by Beatrix Potter Two Hearts That Beat as One by Frank Norris for the 1903 collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Two Hearts That Beat as One by Frank Norris. Which it puts it up as how you ain't never heard about that time that Hardenberg and Stroker, the Englisher, had a friendly go with bare knuckles, ten rounds it was, all along a female woman? It is a small world, and I had just found out that my friend, Bunt McBride, horse wrangler, miner, faro dealer, and bone gatherer, whose world was the plains and ranges of the great southwest, was known of the three black crows, Hardenberg, Stroker, and Ali Bazan, and had even foregathered with them on more than one of their ventures for Cyrus Ryder's exploitation agency. Ventures that had nothing of the desert in them, but that involved the sea and the schooner and the taste of the great lunged canorous trades. You ain't never crossed the trail of that mournful history? I professed my ignorance and said, They fought? Mr. Man, returned Bunt soberly, as one broaching a subject not to be trifled with. They sure did. Friendly like, you know, like as how two high-stepping sassy gents figures out how to settle any little strained relations friendly like but considerable keen he took a pinch of tobacco from his pouch and a bit of paper and rolled a cigarette in the twinkling of an eye using only one hand in true mexican style now he said as he drew the first long puff to the very bottom of the leathern valves he calls his lungs now i'm a goin for to relate that same painful proceedin to you just so as you can get a line on the consumin and devourin foolishness o male humans when they's a woman in the wind woman said bunt wagglin his head thoughtfully at the water woman is a weather breeder mr dixon they is three things i'm scared of the last two i don't just rightly call to mind at this moment but the first is woman. When I meets up with a female woman on my trail, I shears off some prompt, Mr. Dixon. I shears off. And Hardenberg, he added irrelevantly, would a took and married this woman. So he would. Yes, and Stroker would, too. Was there another man? I asked. No, said Bunt. Then he began to chuckle behind his mustaches. Yes, they was. He smote a thigh. They sure was another man for fair. Well now, Mr. Man, let me tell you the whole how. It began with me being took into a wild-eyed scheme that that maverick, Cy Ryder, had cooked up for the three crows. They was a road down Gordamaller White. Some gizabi named Palachi, Barreto Palachi finding times dull and the boys some off their feed ups and says to hisself exercise is what i needs i will now take an overthrow to blame government well the same palachi rounds up a bunch of insurrectos and begins pestering and badgering and hectoring the government and rearing round and bellering and making a procession of hisself till he sure pervades the landscape and before you knows what Lo and behold, here's a real live revolution thing kaiutlin in the scenery, and the government is plumb bothered. They rounds up the Gazabi at last at a place on the coast, but he escapes as easy as how do you do? He can't, howsomever, get back to his insurrectos, the blamed government being in possession of all the trails leading into the hinterland. So says he. What for a game would it be for me to hack up to Frisco and get in touch with my financial backers and conspirate to smuggle down a load of arms? Which the same he does, and there's where the three black crows and me begin to take a hand. Cy Ryder 
gives us the job of taking the schooner down to a certain point on the Guatemala coast, and they are delivering to the agent of the Gazabo three thousand stand of forty-eight Winchesters. When we gets this far into the game, Ryder ups and says, Boys, here's where I cashes right in. You sets right to me for the schooner and the cargo. But you goes to Palachi's agent over crossed the bay for instructions and directions. But, says the Englisher, Stroker, this betting a blind play don't suit our hand. Why not, says he, make right up to Mr. Palachi hisself? No, says Ryder, no, boys, you can't. The senor is lying as low as a toad in a wheel track these days because of the prying and meddling disposition of the local authorities. No, he says, ye must have your palaver with the agent, which is a woman, and thereon I groans low and despairing. So soon as he mentions female, I knowed trouble was in the atmosphere, and right there is where I sure loses my presence of mind. What I should have done was to say, Mr. Ryder, Hardenberg, and gents, all, you're good boys, and you drinks and deals fair, and I loves you all with a love that can never, never die for the terms o your natural lives, and may God have mercy on your souls. But I ain't keeping case on this ere game no longer. Woman and me is mules in music. We ain't never made to ride in the same go-kart. Goodbye. That all is what I should have said. But I didn't. I walked right plumb into the slough, like the mudhead that I was, and got mired for fair, just as I might a knowed I would. Well, Ryder gives us a, a dress over across the bay, and we fair hikes over there all along, oh, as cruel a rain as ever killed crops. We finds the place after a while, a lodging house, all lorn and loony, set down all by itself in the middle of some real estate extension like a teepee in a barren, a crazy modern house, all gimcrack and woodwork and frostin', with never another place in so far as you could hear a coyote yelp. Well, we bucks right up and asks of the party at the door if the Senorita Esperanza Ulivari, that was who Ryder had told us to ask for, might be concealed upon the premises, and we shows Cy Ryder's note. The party that opened the door was a greaser, the worst looking I ever clapped eyes on. It looked like the kind what'd steal the coppers off his dead grandmother's eyes. Anyhow, he says to come in, gruff like, and to wait, poco tiempo. Well, we waited, mucho tiempo, muy mucho, all a settin' on the edge of the sofa with her hats on her knees, like filly birds on a rail and a countin' of the patterns in the wallpaper to pass the time along. And Hardenberg, who's got to do the talkin', gets the fidgets by and by, and because he's only restin' the toes of his feet on the floor, his knees begin jiggerin', and along a watchin' him, my knees begin to go, and then strokers, and then alley bazans. And there we sat all in a row and jiggered and jiggered, Great snakes, it makes me sick to the stomach to think of the idiots we were. Then, after a long time, we hears a rustle of silk petticoats, and we all grabs hold of one another and looks scared-like out from under our eyebrows. And then, then, Mr. Man, they walks into that bunkhouse parlor, the loveliest-looking young female woman that ever wore hair. She was lovelier than Mary Anderson. She was lovelier than Lotta. She was tall and black-haired and had a eye, well, I don't know, when she gave you the littlest flicker of that same eye, you felt it was about time to take and lie right down and say, I would esteem it, ma'am, a sure smart favor if you was to take and wipe your boots on my waistcoat, just so's you could hear my heart a beating. That's the kind of female woman she was. Well, when Hardenberg had caught his second wind, we begins to talk business. And you're to take a passenger back with you, says Esperanza after a while. 
What for a passenger might it be, says Hardenberg. She fished out her calling card at that and tore it in two and gave Hardenberg one half. It's the party, she says, that'll come aboard off San Diego on your way down and who will show up the other half of the card, the half I have here, and which the same I'm going to mail to him. And you be sure the half's fit before you let him come aboard. And when that party comes aboard, she says, he's to take over charge. Very good, says Hardenberg, mincing and silly like a cheesy cat lapping cream. Very good, ma'am. Your orders shall be obeyed. He sure said it just like that, as if he spoke out of a storybook, and I kicked him under the table for it. Then we palavers a whole lot and settles the way the thing is to be run, and finally, when we'd got as far as could be that day, the senorita stood up and says, Now, me good fellows, twas Spanish, she spoke, Now, me good fellows, you must drink a drink with me. She herds us all up into the dining room and fetches out, not whiskey, mind you, but a great fat green and gold bottle of champagne, and when Alabazan has fired it off, she fills our glasses, dinky little flat glasses that look like flower vases. Then she stands up there before us, fine and tall, all in black silk, and puts her glass up high and sings out, To the revolution! And we, all solemn-like, says, To the revolution, and crooks our elbows. When we all comes to, about half an hour later, we're in the street outside, haven't just said goodbye to the senorita. We all are some quiet, the first block or so, and then Hardenberg says, stopping dead in his tracks. I pauses to remark that when a certain young female party, having black hair and a killing eye, gets good and ready to travel up the center aisle of a church, I know the gent to show her the way, which he is six feet one in his stocking feet, some freckled across the nose and shoots with both hands which the same observations speaks of stroker twirling his yeller lady killer which the same observations he says has my hearty endorsement and cooperation saving in, in the particular of the description of the gent the gent is five foot eleven high three feet thick is the only son of my mother and has yellow mustaches and a buck tooth he don't qualify, puts in Hardenberg, first because he's a Englisher, and second because he's up again a uh, American, and besides he has a tooth that's bucked. Buck or no buck, flares out Stroker, what might be the meaning of that remark concerning being an Englisher? The fact of his being English, says Hardenberg, is only half the whole handle, t'other half being the fact that the first name gent is all American. No Yank ain't never took no dust from aft a Englisher, whether it were war, walking matches, or women. But they's a Englisher, sings out Strucker, not forty miles from here as can nick the nose of a freckled Yank, if so be occasion require. Now ain't that plum foolish like, observed Bunt philosophically. Ain't it plum foolish like of them two gisabis to go flying up in the air like two he hens on a hot plate for nothing in the world but because a neat looking female woman has looked at em some soft? Well, naturally, we others, Ally Bazan and me, we others throws it into em pretty strong about being more kinds of blame fools than a pup with a bug. And they simmers down some. But along of the way home, I can see as how they're a glaring at each other and a drawing theirselves up proud like an presumptuous and I groans again not loud but deep as the good book says we has two or three more palavers with the senorita esperanza and stacks the deck to beat the harbor police and the customs people and all and to nip down the coast with our contraband and each time we chins with the senorita there's them two locos stepping and sidling around her acting that silly like that me and ally bazan 
takes and beats our heads again the walls so soon as we're alone just because we're that pison mortified finally comes the last talky talk and we're to sail away next day and maybe snatch the little joker through or be took and hung by the costa guardis and good-bye says hardenberg to esperanza in a fainting die-away voice like a kitten with a cold and ain't we going to meet no more i sure hopes as much puts in stroker smirkin so's you'd think he was a he milliner selling a bonnet i hope says he our delightful acquaintanceship ain't a going for to end abrupt this away oh you nice big mister men pipes up the senorita in english we will meet down there in guatemala soon again yes because i go down by the vapor carriages to-morrow unprotected too says hardenberg wagging his fool head and so young holy geronimo i don't know what more fool drivelin they had but they finally comes away alibazan and me rounds em up and conducts em to the boat and puts em to bed like as if they was little or drunk and the next day or next night rather about one o'clock we slips the heel ropes and hobbles all the schooner quiet as a mountain land stockin a buck and catches the out tide through the gate of the bay lord we was some keyed up let me tell you and ally bazan and hardenberg was at the fore end of the boat with their guns ready in case of being asked impertinent questions by the patrol boats well howsomever we nips out with the little jokers they was writ in the manifest as mining pumps and starts south this ere pass here down to gordamala is the first time i goes a gallin about on what the three crows calls blue water and when that schooner hit the bar i begins to remember that my stomach and inside arrangements ain't made o no chilled steel nor yet o rawhide first i gets plumb sad and shivery and i feels as mean and poor as a prairie dog which has eat a horned toad backwards i goes to ally bazan and gives it out as how i'm going for to die and i puts it up that i'm sure sad and depressed like and don't care much about life no how and that present surroundings lack that certain undescribable charm i tells him that i knows the ship is going to sink afore we get over the bar waves they was higher in the mass and i've rode some fair lively sunfishers in my time but i ain't never struck anything like the rarin and buckin and high and lofty tumblin that that same boat went through with those first few hours after we had come out but Ali Bazan tells me to go downstairs in the boat and lie quiet, and by and by I do feel better. By next day I can sit up and take solid food again, and then's when I takes special notice of the everlasting foolishness of Stroker and Hardenberg. You'd have thought each one of them two mushheads was trying to act the part of an old cow which has had her calf took. They goes a moonin' about the boat that mournful it'd make you yell just out of sheer nervousness. First one would up and hold his head on his hand and lean on the fence rail that ran around the boat and sigh till he'd raise his pants clean out of the top of his boots. And then the other'd go off in another part of the boat and he'd sigh and moon and take on fit to sicken a coyote. But by and by, there were maybe six days to the good old Frisco, by and by, they too gets kind of sassy along each t'other, and they has a heart-to-heart -heart talk, and puts it up as how either one of em ud stand to win, so only the t'other was out of the game. It's double or nothing, says Hardenberg, who was something o' a card sharp for either you or me, stroke, and if you're agreeable i'll play you a round of jacks for the chance at the cinderita the loser to pull out of the runnin for good and all no stroker don't come in on no such game he says he wins her he says as a man and not as no poker player no 
nor he won't throw no dice for the chance of winning Esperanza, nor he won't flip no coin, nor yet wrestle. But, says he, all of a sudden, I'll tell you which I'll do. You're a big, thick, strappin' hulk of a two-fisted dray horse, hearty, and I ain't no a feet and degenerate one lunger myself. Here's what I propose, that we all takes and lays out a sixteen-foot ring on the quarter-deck, and that the raw-boned Yank and the stodgy Englisher strips to the waist, and all friendly-like settles a question by Queensbury rules, and may the best man win. Hardenberg looks him over. And what might be your weight, says he, I don't figure on hurtin' of you, if so be you're below my class. I fights at a hundred and seventy, says Stroker, and me, says Hardenberg, at a hundred and seventy-five. We're matched. Is it a go? inquires Stroker. You bet your great grandmammy's tortoise shell chessy cat it's a go, says Hardenberg, prompt as a hop frog catching flies. We don't lose no time trying to reason with them, for they is sure keen on having the go, so we lays out a ring by the rear end of the deck, and runs the schooner in till we're in the lee of the land, and she riding steady on her pins. Then, along about four o'clock on a fine still day, we lays the boat to, as they say, and folds up the sail, and having scattered resin in the ring, which it ain't no ring, but a square of ropes on posts. We says all is ready. Ali Bazan, he's referee, and me, I'm the timekeeper, which I has to ring the ship's bell every three minutes to let him know to quit and that the drowned is over. We gets him into the ring, each in his own corner, squatting on a bucket, the timekeeper being second to Hardenberg, and the referee being second to Stroker. And then, after they has shuck hands, I climbs up on the chicken coop and hollers, Time! And they begins. Mr. Man, I saw Tim Hennon at his best, and I saw Sayers when he was a top-notcher, and likewise several other irregular boxing sharps that were sure tough terriers. Also, I have saw two short-horn bulls arguing about a question of leadership, but so help me Bob. The fight I saw that day made the others look like a young lady's quadrille. Oh, I ain't going to tell all that mill in detail, nor by rounds. Rounds? After the first five minutes, they want no rounds. I rung the blame bell till I rung her loose, and Alibazan yells, Break away, and time's up, till he's black in the face. But you could no more separate them two than you could put the brakes on a blame earthquake. At about supper time, we pulled them apart. We could do it by then. They was both so gone, and jammed each one of em down in their corners. I rings my bell good and plenty, and Alibazan stands up on a bucket in the middle of the ring and says, I declare this here glove contest a draw. And draw it sure was. They fit for two hours steady, and never a one got no better of the other. They give each other lick for lick as fast and as steady as they could stand to it. Wrestling, boring in, boxing, all was alike. The one was just as good as the other, and both willing to the very last. When Alibazan calls it a draw, they gets up and wobbles toward each other and shakes hands. And Hardenberg, he says, Stroke, I thanks you a whole lot for as neat a go as ever I mixed in. And Stroker answers up. Hardy, I loves you better than ever. You's the first man I've met up with which I couldn't do for, and I've met up with some scraggy propositions in my time, too. Well, they too is a sorry-looking pair of birds by the time we runs into San Diego Harbor next night. They was fine-looking objects for fair, all bruises and bumps. You remember now we was to take on a party at San Diego. We was to show t'other half of Esperanza's card and thereafterward to boss the job. Well, we waits till nightfall and then slides in and lays two off a certain pile of stone and shows two green lights and one white every three and a half minutes for half an hour, this being the signal. They is a moon and we can see pretty well. After we'd signaled about an hour, maybe, 
we gets the answer. A one-minute green flare, and thereafterward we makes out a rowboat, putting out and coming towards us. There is two people in the boat. One is the gazabi at the oars, and the other a party sitting in the hinder end. Ali Bazan and me, and Stroker, and Hardenberg, we's all leaning over the fence a watching. When all to once, I ups and groan some sad. The party in the hinder end of the boat being female. Ain't we never going to get shut of em, says I, but the words ain't no more'n off my teeth when Stroker pipes up. It's she, says he, gasping as though shot hard. What? cries Hardenberg, sort of mystified. Oh, I'm sure a dreamin', he says, just that silly like. And the mugs we got, says Stroker, and they both sets to swearin' and cussin' to beat all I ever heard. I can't let her see me so bunged up, says Hardenberg, doleful like. Oh, whatever is to be done. And I look like a real genuine blown in the bottle pug, whimpers Stroker. Never mind, says he, we must face the music. We'll tell her these are sure honorable scars. Got because we fit for her. Well, the boat comes up, and the female party jumps out and comes up the let-down stairway onto the deck. Without saying a word, she hands Hardenberg the half of the card, and he fishes out his half and matches the two by the light of a lantern. By this time, the rowboat has gone a little ways off, and then, at last, Hardenberg says, Welcome aboard, senorita. And Stroker cuts in with, We thought it was to be a man that had joined us here to take command. But you, he says, and oh, butter wouldn't have melted in his mouth. But you, he says, is always our mistress. Very right, bueno, me good fellows, says the senorita. But don't you be afraid that there's no man is at the head of this business. And with that, the party chucks off hat and skirts, and I'll be Mexican if it want a man after all. I'm the Signor Barito Palacci, gentlemen, says he. The gringo police, who wanted for to arrest me, made the disguise necessary. Gentlemen, I regret to have been obliged to deceive such gallant compadres, but war knows no law. Hardenberg and Stroker gives one look at the Signor and another at their own spiled faces. Then... Come back here with the boat, roars Hardenberg over the side. And with that, upon me word, you'd have thought they two both were moved with the same spring. Over they goes into the water and strikes out hands over hands for the boat as hard as ever they can lay to it. The boat meets him. Lord knows what the party at the oars thought. They climbs in, and the last I sees of them, they was puttin' for shore, each having taken a oar from the boatmen. And they sure was making that boat hum. Well, we sails away eventually without em. And a year or more afterward, I crosses their trail again in Cy Ryder's office in Frisco. Did you ask them about it all? said I. Mr. Man, observed Bunt, I'm several kinds of a fool. I know it. But sometimes I'm wise. I wishes for to live as long as I can and die when I can't help it. I does not neither there nor there afterward, ever make no joke, nor yet no allusion about or concerning the Senorita Esperanza Palachi, in the hearing of Hardenberg and Stroker. I've seen, you remember, both those boys use their fists, and likewise Hardenberg, as he says himself, shoots with both hands. End of Two Hearts That Beat as One by Frank Norris Why Should Hebrew Christians Unite? By the Chairman, Rev. A. R. Coldwell for the 1903 Collection From Minutes of the First Hebrew Christian Conference of the United States Held at Mountain Lake Park, Maryland, July 28th through 30th, 1903 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Why Should Hebrew Christians Unite? By Rev. A. R. Coldell. In Christ Beloved, it causes me great pleasure to address this large audience tonight on the subject, Why Hebrew Christians Should Unite. It is true that in comparison with the multitude of Gentile Christians present, the number of Hebrew Christians in this conference seems quite small, but this little company grows in my mind into a great host when I think of the longings and aspirations of the great body of Hebrew believers in this and other lands, crystallized in this little company here present. Brethren, a great multitude of Hebrew believers in this and other lands are praying during these days for God's guidance and spirit upon our deliberations. They know how much the usefulness of blessedness of a future alliance is conditioned by the kind of a foundation we lay for it at this conference. They know the great difficulties in the way. They know the differences between the different evangelical churches through whose instrumentalities we have been brought to Christ. And they know the affection and loyalty with which most of us are clinging to the denominations among whom we have found the Messiah. We all know the discouragements we shall have to meet with both from within and from without. But the fact that so many of our brethren are praying and longing for a closer union between us, and that so many Gentile Christians from different denominations are attending our sessions, and that many others are praying for our success, is an indication that God's time has come and that we must go forward. Allow me, therefore, to point out a few thoughts on the subject. 1. Because of our own need. We cannot afford to forget the rock from which we are hewn. We have indeed given our people's unbelief, but we cannot give up our people. We have joined the Church of the Firstborn, composed of individuals, called out of all nations, to be a people unto His name. But we have not, and dare not, give up our nationality. Our nation stands unique in God's plan of the ages. God has not dealt so with any nation. Of all the nations, ours is the only one that owes its birth to a miracle. To them pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is God over all, blessed for ever. Amen. Romans 9. Israel is the everlasting nation. Isaiah 44. It is prefigured by the burning bush, which was never consumed. Israel's call and election are not of works or merit, but of grace, and God's calling and gifts are without repentance. Salvation is of the Jews. They were the seed-sowers at the beginning and they shall be the sheaf-gatherers at the end of this dispensation. Zachary 8, verse 13, Isaiah 66. We are Christians indeed, followers of the Lamb. But we live not under the law, but under grace. If Israel is ever to claim God's glorious promises, it will have to do so by faith. But he has given us the faith. Do you wonder, then, that Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, calls the believing Jews the Israel of God? Galatians 6.16 We must stand together as the Israel of God. We ought to unite because our nation needs it. The national movements among our people are inaugurated by men who are blind leaders of the blind. Whilst God is able to make even the wrath of men to praise him, yet we know that when the blind leads the blind, both fall into the ditch. As disunited individuals, our influence for good is like an atom lost in the breeze, but united into one 
living, loving, shining mass, our impact will not fail to make the desired impression on our people. Our people needs this union. 3. The church needs it. Unbelieving Israel's sojourn among the Christian nations has ripened many grave problems whose solution has proved quite unpleasant to Jew and Gentile alike. There is a curse resting upon our people because of their unbelief. Isaiah 43, 27, 28, Malachi 2. By God's grace, Israel is a blessing, but despising this grace, it becomes a curse to the nations. Zechariah 8, 13. Since they cried out at cavalry, his blood be upon us and our children. They have become the tribes of the wandering foot and weary breast. They cause irritation wherever they settle for any length of time. They seem to become distressing to the nations as an unassimilated foreign element in an organic body. Statesmen and politicians having tried all kinds of nostrums, and the church, alas, too frequently taking refuge to quackery, have only aggravated the trouble. False love, based upon the denial of the truth, as it is in Jesus, will as little turn Israel's curse into a blessing as Christless hatred. We, the men of Israel, who were once blind, but now see, we who were sick, and are now healed, yea, we who were dead, and are now alive, we must point the nation and the church to the fountain of healing and life even for Israel and its troubles. We ourselves have drank from that fountain. We have tasted that power and that life. Move together, brethren, from the east and the west, from the north and the south. You need not give up your denominational badges as long as your denominations stand for the living and saving Christ. We do not stand as members of denominations here, but as members of one nation, sick and footsore, wandering and bleeding, Christless and dying. Let us cry with united agony of voice to him, Come, Lord Jesus, come and save thine inheritance, and to his blood-bolted church. Come to the rescue of our perishing brethren. They need your sympathy your prayers, your love, your testimony. In blessing them ye shall be blessed. And to our brethren, the Jews, let us cry, Israel, thou destroyest thyself, but in Jesus is thy salvation. Yes, this alliance of redeemed and consecrated Israelites must come to pass. We ourselves need it, the Jews need it, the church needs it, and God will bless it. Amen. End of Why Hebrew Christians Should Unite by Rev. A. R. Caldwell A Machine That Flies by The Times Dispatch, Richmond, Virginia, for the 1903 collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. A machine that flies, big box kite, driven by six propellers, soars the air at Kitty Hawk, Norfolk, Virginia, December 18. A successful trial of a flying machine was made yesterday near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, by Wilbur and Orville Wright of Dayton, Ohio. The machine flew for three miles in the face of a wind blowing at the registered velocity of twenty-one miles an hour, and then gracefully descended to earth at the spot selected by the man in the navigator's car as a suitable landing place. The machine has no balloon attachment, but gets its force from propellers worked by a small engine. Preparatory to its flight, the machine was placed upon a platform near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. This platform was built on a high sand hill, 
and when all was in readiness, the fastenings to the machine were released, and it started down an incline. The navigator, Wilbur Wright, then started a small gasoline engine, which worked the propellers. When the end of the incline was reached, the machine gradually arose until it obtained an altitude of sixty feet. In the face of the strong wind blowing it, maintained an even speed of eight miles an hour. The idea of the box kite has been adhered to in the basic formation of the flying machine. A huge framework of light timbers, 33 feet wide, 5 feet deep, and 5 feet across the top, forms the machine proper. This is covered with a tough but light canvas. In the center, and suspended just below the bottom plan, is the small gasoline engine, which furnishes the motive power for the propelling and elevating power for the propelling and elevating wheels. There are six blade propellers, one arranged just below the center of the frame, so gauged as to exert an upward force when in motion, and the other extends horizontally to the rear from the center of the car, furnishing the forward impetus. Protruding from the center of the car is a huge fan-shaped rudder of canvas stretched upon a frame of wood. This rudder is controlled by the navigator and may be moved to each side, raised or lowered. No test today. Special to the Times Dispatch. Norfolk, Virginia, December 18. No test was made today of the flying machine invented by Wilbur and Orville Wright of Dayton to spend the holidays and will at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, Thursday. The Wright brothers will leave tomorrow for Dayton to spend the holidays and will return to Kitty Hawk after New Year's to perfect their invention. End of A Machine That Flies by the Times-Dispatch, Richmond, Virginia.